How you all doing tonight? Good. Welcome. Welcome. Let's just open a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, tonight we come seeking after you. We come tonight not for a verbal battle or assault or to come with competing ideas or thoughts for the sake of anything other than truth and seeking after you and desiring your word to come to life in our midst and in this place. So tonight that you would just speak through these pastors, through these leaders, through these who have poured their life out for you, God, that your words would come to life through this word and through that which is spoken. We give you glory and honor for all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, welcome. I'm just going to ask my brother over here to hand out some papers, if he'd be so kind. At the end of some of the things that they're talking about today, there's a lot of different topics, and you might have some questions, so you can jot down anything you might want to know, anything you want to ask specifically. If you want to specifically direct them at one of the two speakers, that's fine. Just make a note of it, but either way, at the end, we'll uh, collect them all up and decide just so there's some order and properness to what we do as far as the questions. But with that, let me just tell you a little bit about both of our speakers. Pastor Michael Miano over here on your left, my right. He served in the pastorate here at Blue Point Bible Church since April 21st, 2013. Both speakers have had really a similar past and a similar life and that God just really brought together and it's kind of interesting that we'll see in Pastor Mike his life's been saved by characterized of gang violence and death and despair but by the grace of God he's been involved in a multitude of ministry efforts in regards to the mission of the church and church reform since 2007. God just radically reached down, touched him and grabbed him and set him off. He's even authored this book, Freaked Out by the New Covenant in 2012 and he's looking to publish a new book called Wicked in mid-2015. Just thinking, you know, had it been written before he came to Christ, it might have been a totally different book and a totally different topic. But amen, thank God that it's not probably about what it was before. Anyway, with a love for reading and a passion to learn, Pastor Miano acquired a Christian education through numerous certificates certificate programs as well as seminary certification through Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. On the practical level, he's been involved in a variety of different ministry pursuits and has served in various positions of church leadership. Specifically in regards to church reform though, Pastor Michael continually pushes for studies in regards to covenant creationism, full preterism, and true biblical application in believers' lives. Pastor Miano has debated in numerous debates about both hell from the annihilationist view and eschatology from the full preterist view. He strives to exhibit a zeal empowered by knowledge, both in his pastorate at Blue Point as well as directing, excuse me, directing the Power of Preterism Network, which serves as a brainstorming and planning network to bring forth the truth of preterism into the local church. He maintains a personal blog and is an avid Facebook user who loves to interact with others regarding biblical truth. So if that sounds exciting to you and interesting to you, I don't know what his blog is, but I'm sure you can find it pretty simple. Pastor Robert, I said similar background and history. He was born and raised in Long Island and in his youth, no gangs, but definitely drugs and alcohol abounded in his life, addicted as a teenager, but a miraculous intervention by God in Robert's life, he was drastically transformed at the age of 18. Soon after committing his life to Christ, he felt a strong call to ministry. He attended Valley Forge Christian College where he earned a BS degree with high honors in Bible and theology with a pastoral emphasis. After two assistant pastorates, he became leader of a small body of believers in Comac, New York in 1983. And having faithfully pastored the flock over a number of years, the church outgrew one building and purchased a larger facility in Smithtown in 1991, where they remained for a number of years. Subsequently, after a time away from pastoring, Pastor Robert began a new ministry in 2004 to a small group of believers in the den of the home where he was reared and grew up in Massapequa. Faith on Fire Ministries, as it's now called, has moved on from these humble beginnings to the build building in which they now meet in Hicksville, New York. He comes with a rich background in the Word and a commitment to its integrity. His love for God and truth is evident wherever he ministers. He's got a passion and a zeal for the Word. and It's evident in his book that he's written called Hidden Treasures, which just expounds on some truths in the Word of God. This is not a presentation of the books that are here. I'm sure they might be on sale, but, you know, that's, again, not the point of tonight. But without further ado, let's just 
get to the first topic, which is the meaning and significance of the creation account, dealing with Genesis 1 to 3. And presenting first will be Pastor Michael. Where'd you go? So when we open up our Bibles, we open up to the book of Genesis. And the first thing that we must do is we must establish what sort of genre of literature that we are reading when we open up Genesis. What are we actually reading about? Genesis translated in the original language would have been Beersheet, meaning the beginning. However, the question I bring before you all this evening is the beginning of what? David Shilton was a reformed pastor and author of several books on economics, eschatology, and Christian worldview, and who once remarked, the Bible is literature, it is divinely inspired and inerrant literature, but it is literature all the same. This means we must read it as literature. We cannot understand what the Bible really means unless we appreciate its use of literary styles. To quote another scholar, late 19th century pastor and professor Milton Terry, who taught apologetics, comparative religion, and Old Testament, one, he once noted, any satisfactory interpretation of Genesis must be preceded by a determination of the class of literature to which it belongs. He goes on to remark, we gain nothing for the honor of scripture by attempting to force upon them a meaning they were never intended to convey. I will present to you this evening that Genesis should be seen as an ancient Near Eastern text. We must understand how they would have understood this sort of writing and the details presented in Genesis. We must understand their worldview and the questions they would have had rather than impose our cultural assumptions and our questions and demand answers to our questions in the 21st century upon that text. We are a people far removed from the culture of Genesis. This is what we would refer to as audience relevance. What was the relevance of Genesis to the original audience? Modern Christians in the Genesis debate tend to be chronocentric, which means they get stuck in their own time period and cultural mindset. What is taken as the common sense understanding of essential nature and geography of the planet Earth today would have been hardly common sense for Christians before the 1500s. I immediately think of the historic controversy between the Catholic Church and Galileo Galilee, or the 18th and 19th century confusion regarding geology and the Christian Church. Couple that with the rise of erroneous biblical interpretation in the 18th and 19th centuries, we see an erroneous biblical literalism being forced upon the book of Genesis. We must ask, how do we understand Genesis literally? Instead of forcing what some call an arbitrary literalism on the text, it is important to grapple with the nature of biblical language in order to properly see what the Bible means by what it says. The main purpose of Genesis is theological and religious. This has been said innumerable times already, but there is a temptation to get too involved in science and forget that this is a theological text. Genesis serves as a polemic against the idolatry in that dark ancient Near Eastern culture. These creations, as you see the sun, the moon, the animals, the ma mankind, are not gods. Instead, they are servants of, they are to serve the true God as is being established in Genesis chapter 1. Kind of like the Apostle Paul's polemic on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17 where he tells them that, in, that unknown God that you all see, that is the true God above all other gods. Obviously the, the pagan gods of that Greek culture. Also, Genesis teaches that the true God was making himself known to Adam. It is... is and he, that he is the only true God. We read a similar account in Isaiah when he's mocking those who create an image of their God out of wood, and he tells them that you, you make your own images of God, you make your own God, and then you worship them. However, you made them. That is, your, you know, that is a making of your own mind. So as we venture back into the culture of Genesis, the ancient Near East, regardless of whether you believe it was 6,000 years ago or if you believe it was more than that, that's a topic for another time, we must come to understand Genesis as an ancient Near Eastern temple text. While I recognize that other pagan writings that come to us from the ancient Near East would hardly be inspired, I think of writings such as the Enuma Elish, which is a Babylonian creation text, or the Egyptian Book of the Dead. These are not inspired, yet they do have resemblance to the book of Genesis. Which God holds authority should be the question that we bring before ourselves when we open up the book of Genesis. What is, who is the true God? This would have been a question of the ancient Near Eastern people. In the Enuma Elish, we read a very similar creation count that we read in Genesis. And this details how the false god Marduk, Babylonian pagan god, 
would ascend to the highest throne in that religious pantheon or that temple in Babylon. The, what we must come to understand when we open up the book of Genesis is we're reading about God creating man in his image. This is in contrast to the way that the other ancient cults in that ancient Near Eastern culture would have said that the animals represented God or that the sun and the moon represented God. Instead, in Genesis, we find that man, man will be the image of God in creation. Man would have dominion over everything else. Again, if you are the image of the God, clearly you have dominion over everything else. We also find rest in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Rest in the ancient Near East would have had a connotation of ruling. That when you rest with God, you rule with God. And again, many of us, everybody in this room, hopefully, would find themselves a Christian, and you would know that when you find your rest in Christ, according to the book of Hebrews, that you are now reigning with Christ. You have been raised up, and you are seated in heavenly places, reigning with Jesus. So we see this in the beginning of Genesis. We see God setting Adam above everything else in that ancient culture and saying, this is that which is going to represent me. When we open up to Genesis chapter 1 and 3, the first thing that we find is that God is presumed. You don't see an argument for, for or against God. You see, God created. Therefore, God was already established. Reason being that in our culture in the 21st century is where man has decided to ascend and create himself as God, that there is no other God. That's something new to our culture. Again, in the ancient Near East, everybody had gods or a god. Everybody had one. Everybody would have recognized Something is out there, you know, whether it was Marduk, again, a false god. However, they would have recognized something. So God is presumed. Again, that shows us the ancient Near Eastern culture. Then we read about how God formed in that term bara. It's important to understand, and again, I understand I'm not a Greek scholar, and maybe many of you aren't as well, or a Hebrew scholar. And many of, you know, again, I don't depend. I don't believe you have to be a Hebrew scholar to understand your Bible. We'll make that precedent right now. So, <laughs> bara simply means to form and fill. It's similar to if I was to say I'm going to create my house into a home. You see, there's a difference. Now, there's another Hebrew word that would be used for creating something out of nothing. And I would make the case that when we're opening up Genesis, that we're not reading about God creating something out of nothing, while I believe he did. Because in Colossians, we read that God is the creator of all things seen and unseen. And then in John 1, we read that God created everything through Jesus. So we would understand right away that our God, the true God, is the creator of all things, seen and unseen. However, I would make the case that Genesis 1 is not telling you that story. Genesis 1 is telling you about how God has decided to come and live in his creation. And we'll, we'll get to what that creation is in a moment here. Now... One of the cases that I've, I've read, and I thought it was an amazing case for the book of Genesis, is how there's a problem being posed to you in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And it is, everything was dark, wasteful, and void. Meaning that creation was not operating according to the purpose to which God had created it. Remember, the Spirit's hovering over the waters. God is about to do something. Every time you see that hovering in Scripture, again, if you have concordance, look up the term hovering, and you'll see God is about to make a move. When God hovers over his creation, he's about to do something in that creation. So I would say that the earth existed prior to Genesis 1. However, what we see God doing is filling the earth. Now he's about to establish a purpose on earth. And I would say that is his covenant relationship with his people. We see Adam created outside the garden. Right? He is formed outside the garden and then he is placed into the garden. What do we understand the Garden of Eden to be? The presence of God. He, Adam is immediately placed into the presence of God. In contrast to all the darkness in the surrounding regions, Adam is now taken out of that darkness and placed into covenant relationship with God. I find it very interesting when you study temple texts and you read about how God had walked among them in the cool of the day. I believe that's Genesis 3.8. That's a temple illusion. If you know uh, anything about the times, you would know that the, the cool of the day is a time where the sun would drop and that cool breeze would go through that land of Canaan. And this would be about 3 p.m. according to our time. And this is also the time of the evening sacrifice. So when you read that, you read that in that text, you begin to get a different picture of what is happening in that garden scene. You have God creating his image, Adam, and now his image is going to have dominion over all of creation. Now you have the problem, again I mentioned, darkness, and you're going to have the solution. Man made in the image of God, and now he is called to walk in the presence of God. However, unfortunately, many of us know our Bibles. We know that Adam does not walk in that image. Adam does exactly what he's not supposed to do, to go eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. One thing I will pose to you all tonight at the beginning of this is, how do we gain knowledge of sin? And I would say by the law. Many of us will we'll get to that soon, don't worry. However, as you read through the book of Genesis, you note a lot of, notice a lot about generations. And you notice you're reading a lineage story. Again, we have Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve fail. 
Adam and Eve, eat of the tree. They are now pronounced dead. But if you remember, God said that the day you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. And I'm putting before you all tonight that the death that Adam died in that garden was a covenantal death. He was cut off with that relationship with God. Never to be the same. Barred from the tree of life. Now he has no opportunity for that eternal life other than something that is far off and is going to come later. Hopefully we all know what that is here. So Adam is removed from the garden, put back into this darkness. However, he is covered by God. He's given a covering. And that covering will allow him to have Seth. Now remember, Cain kills Abel. And now Cain is cast out into the land of Nod. I promise you, if you do research on the land of Nod, you will not find a location because the land of Nod simply means wandering. He was cast out of the garden to wander aimlessly, just like those in that pagan region that were worshiping all other false gods. So we have now Adam dies, a covenantal death, cast out of the garden, and you would think there's no hope. However, the next thing you read about is the birth of Seth. Now they begin to call upon the name of the Lord. There's hope. They fell. Cain kills Abel. You see Lamech now starts killing. You know, just a horrendous moment there in Genesis chapters 3, or three through 6. You see society getting pretty wicked. And then all of a sudden, Seth is born. They begin to call upon the name of the Lord. And I will posit that Genesis is a beginning of Israel. Because what you will see now, if we follow the lineage as we've been taught from our Bible, again, I'm asking everybody this evening to remove your presuppositions about what you've been taught from the book of Genesis, other than what Pastor Robert is going to bring before you all, obviously. However, when we read about Seth, then we end up reading the lineage of Seth. And if you notice, you pick up the book of Genesis, you read a lot about descendants, all these descendants, the descendants of Seth. But you know what you don't notice? The descendants of Cain. What happened? They're not in the story anymore. They're not, they don't, it's not important. They're not a part of that. They are dead to God now. And now what you're going to read about is the lineage of Seth. And then you know that the Seth, Seth is going to go to Noah. Noah's going to birth Shem. You also, you read about the lineage of Jepheth and Ham. However, you know that they are to serve God, the, to serve the um, Shemites, right? Shem gives birth to Abram. And I think many of us know what happens at that point, right? Abraham becomes the father of multitudes. And then the story will continue when we get to the law of Moses. Everybody likes to hear their name. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, I believe Genesis 1 through 3 is the story of creation, but I do not believe that it answers, that it poses to answer the question as to when creation took place, nor do I believe that Genesis attempts to uh, answer the question how creation took place. I think it answers the question why creation took place. And I think that's very important because if we look for biological information in the book of Genesis, we're misguided. It's a theological treatise. If we look for geographical information, we're misled. It's spiritual. If we look for the, to find out the age or the antiquity of the race, we're going down the wrong path. It's about the unity of the race. So that's very important. And uh, very quickly, uh, this is why what's going on in, when people look at Genesis, they, most people take some kind of concordance view. What that means is this. They either try to make everything in science fit what the Bible says, or they try to make everything in the Bible fit what science says. And I think both are erroneous. I don't think, I don't think God was really interested in trying to teach humanity that the earth isn't flat. I don't think he was trying to teach humanity uh, anything really about the solar system. He was trying to teach them about the Lord of the solar system. Uh, that's very important. Genesis 1 through 3 then is the front end of our world view. It tells us where we came from, tells us what we're doing here, it tells us where we're headed. And so um, I see creation not as much as a covenantal, though it includes covenant, but I see creation as a creation of a kingdom. God is on a mission to glorify himself. God dwells in the heavens. He works and creates the earth. The heavens are the Lord's. The earth is his footstool. He creates the earth. Heaven is where God dwells. Earth is where he works. As an expression of his glory, he creates. As he creates, he says it's good. 
it's good. It's good. Upon creating man, he says it's very good. And then he rests from his creation. And so he sits back with the intention of enjoying all that he's created. Man in relationship with him, fellowship with him, enjoyment of him, so far so good. I do agree with Pastor Michael that uh, when you study the ancient Near Eastern texts and the Bible, one of the great contrasts is that man, uh, in the ancient Near Eastern texts, man exists for creation. But in the Bible account, creation exists for man. And God puts man oh, only less than himself, Psalms 8 and 5, a little lower than Elohim, just below God. Man only is said to be made in the image and the likeness of God. Nothing else that he creates fits that category. Man alone holds this high and rightful privilege. I believe image and likeness are, are distinctive. I don't think they're repetitive terms. I don't think image and likeness describe the same thing. I just think they describe two different aspects of humanity. We are in his image and in his likeness. In his image speaks to us about our relation to God, about the uniqueness of that relation and the ability to relate with him. We are a reflection of him. We are as close in the order of his creation uh, to him as anything could be. We are made in his image, like sons of his in this unique relation. But then to be in his likeness means that we are, uh, we are to be um, like, God's, like God in an expression of ourselves or an expression of him. So in rel relation to creation, we bear his likeness. This is why dominion was a large part of the expression of that image. You see, because now, like God, man is going to rule. He gives him dominion over all the rest of creation. Creation doesn't have dominion over man. Man has dominion over creation. So the likeness is a resemblance. It's also a resemblance in relation between Adam and Eve, between mankind. It was intended to carry out that unity and that fellowship and that relation. God likeness, the love of God and, and, and those things. I just think this is uh, really important because that was God's original design, that man would be in his unique relation as a vice region of God uh, throughout creation, reflecting, portraying um, as a serving king kind of thing. Say, so there's this covenant relationship that brings, so to me, image and likeness establishes the idea that there is a covenant between God and man, uh, which, bit, which assumes some kind of responsibility of faithfulness, of loyalty, of devotion. Traditionally, it's always been called the covenant of works uh, in, in the book of Genesis. Um, I, re I see it more as a covenant of grace because God said you can enjoy it all. God says, I've made this all for you. God said, I want you, to, I want you to have freedom here. It's all about God's goodness. And he said, just, just this one thing. Just this one thing stay clear of. Just this one thing. Just, just don't go there. And of course, we know man has to go there. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I think today they call it, many call it a creation covenant. I like that term. Um, the biblical theme, and I'm setting this now, in the five minutes I got left, I think the biblical theme uh, throughout the Bible as we talk tonight that I'm going to see is kingdom. God has created a kingdom in the book of Genesis. And it is a kingdom that he is, means to establish through covenant. He creates a covenant with man, and through that covenant he wants to expand a kingdom. So whoever Adam is, and we know that you know, this is written 5th century B.C. His Hebrew name is Adam. What his, what his name was, we don't really know because he, he was not created 5th century B.C. He's just written about 5th century B.C. He is man. Adam is man. And as man, he is the covenantal head of all mankind. And that is simply to say that um, Adam does not just represent a people, Adam represents all people. This is God creates his kingdom. Adam is the covenantal head. As it goes with Adam, so it goes with the race. The years ago, they used to call it the federal headship theory, that Adam is the covenantal federal head of the human race. That's the way I learned it in Bible college. Today, they like to use other words like archetypal and, and things. But to me, it's all the same thing. Basically, there's two different views there. Is there a realist view and a representative view? Very quickly, a realist view says that we were actually in Adam. We, Adam, we were all parented by Adam. Adam we, a realist view means we were dynamically and actually 
in Adam's loins and we came from him. The representative view says that that doesn't really matter. What matters is God designated him as a covenantal head. And so as it goes with Adam, so it goes with the rest of us. So it all goes well and then God rests on the seventh day and he resides in his creation, enjoys his creation, his fellowship with his creation, and then comes sin. Now sin brings what God promised it would bring, death. I see death as a positional death. A, it is a covenantal death which separates man from God, but it issues in certain conditions changing within mankind. It's positional and it's conditional. So it's first spiritual, but it's secondly temporal. It's not just that he died in fellowship with God, but because he died in fellowship with God, he also died. Not immediately, but the, the seeds of decay came into his life. Corruption came in the midst of incorruption. And, and you see, one of the reasons why God bans Adam from the tree of life is because if he partakes of that tree of life, he's going to live forever. I don't believe necessarily that immortality was inherent in creation. I don't think that immortality was something Adam possessed, but I think it was something that would have been granted him, would have been given him, given him had it not been for disobedience. He would have had access to the tree of life and he would have lived forever, not just covenantally, but biologically, physically, in whatever form Adam was. And obviously it couldn't be the form exactly that we're in today because we are formed in corruption. We are formed in decay. And uh, so I think it's very important though that we recognize both a spiritual and a temporal, a spiritual and a physical consequence to the fall. Um, man rejects God's rightful rule, practices, uh, chooses his independence, and there's trouble in paradise. So God's glory is diminished, but it's not defeated. Man has lost the plot, but God has not lost the plot. God has a plan, and the plan is not termination, the plan is redemption. And so we have the first, the proto-gospel, and that is Genesis, or well, the proto-evangel, Genesis 3.15, where God says there's going to be a triumph coming out of the woman's seed. There's going to be a victory that I'm going to bring and I'm going to defeat the plot of the serpent. I don't believe the serpent was a biological snake. I think the serpent was the proper name for the devil. I think he's called that old serpent, the dragon, Lucifer, the devil. So in the book of Revelation, is he not? So those are all proper titles uh, to, who, to who Satan was. And I believe it was part of their responsibility to keep him out of that garden. And I believe they let him in. So, so I, I don't see the serpent in any way being about a snake, just to throw that out. But I think uh, the point of Genesis is that sin and its effects are going to be trumped. The kingdom of God is going to be established. God is going to do what God wants to do. And, and now from, he's going to begin to use, uh, go about creating a new creation, so to speak. The ultimate goal when we get to the, the last thing here today is going to be about new creation. I'm sure we're both going to talk about new creation. The takeaway is this. God's commitment to his glory is primary. God created this world to be glorified. He will be glorified. He is, dest he is determined to be glorified. He is this, uh, his determination to be glorified is the source and the springhead of everything that he does. His commitment to creation is secondary. It is second to that. He loves us because he loves his glory. And his glory is wrapped up in loving us. He treats us like he treats us because his glory is wrapped up in the way he treats us. And I think this is a very, very important theological concept. So the order is simply this. Creation, fall, redemption, and consummation or new creation. Romans 5, close it with this. We are all in Adam. That is, he was our federal head. He was our covenant representative. He did not represent a select people. He re represented all of humanity from its very beginning. So all get the bad rap. All get the, the covenantal aspects of it and the conditional aspects of it. And so death reigns. And so corruption has set in. So these things that we face and the troubles that we face and so on and so forth. But there's another covenant, praise God. There's another covenant made with Christ. There's another covenant for all those who are in Christ. And because we have come to saving faith through the grace of God, we are no longer, no longer forever to be 
We are no longer in Adam covenantally. We are in Christ. The old man in Adam is dead. The new man in Christ is alive. And all the consequences of that to the glory of God shall be fulfilled. And my time is up. God bless you. <laughs> So, oh, I was going to do the MC. <laughs> in, in between each section, we'll just have a time where they can each ask each other a question about what they shared. So, so I go first. Pastor Mike, I just, I just wanted a clarification. And to me, to me, I mean, you could do as you will, but my, my thinking is more than to debate tonight, I think, that my questions will all be for clarification. Because I just want to hear what you have to say so that I could glean what I could glean and I could go where I got to go and maybe I'll have a good sermon next week. <laughs> so that's, whoa, that's, that's why I'm here. Um, so I'm going to ask questions not to like find a loophole, but I'm going to ask questions too. With that in mind, I just, I just want this clarification. I'm going to hold it. How about I help you? I'm here to help with the mic. <laughs> I'm going to knock him out. That's my son. <laughs> Impartial. Uh, <laughs> we've, we've talked a little bit, Pastor Michael and I, and I, I really like him. I, I, um, we both read John Walton's book. Um, my question to you is this, and I, I'm really asking two in one shot. Um, does, does Genesis depict... Does Genesis 1, 2, and 3 depict natural creation? Does it depict natural creation or simply by your use of the word bara uh, being formed, is it just the forming of the covenant that it means to depict, ignoring really creation, the ordering of the universe for covenant, um, and, and along with that is Adam the first human being? Okay. Just gonna twist this here. All right, thank you. Well, first, I would uh, say that for using the term bara, that uh, no, that Genesis is not um, speaking about a literal creation from ex nihilo, um, you know, something out of nothing, um, the earth. However, the reason why I arrive at that conclusion is when I open up Genesis and I read through the, you know, the days, the days of creation, we have, as uh, was mentioned this morning, we have um, vegetation happening before the sun and the moon are created which to me poses a problem. Um, and then when we read Genesis 1 and 2, we have two different creation accounts. We have man being created prior to, you know, prior to the garden in one story, and then you have the garden being created and man placed in another story, in, in, both in Genesis 1 and 2. You know, and then there's many theories on that, whether they're talking about two different things or if they're a recapitulation, meaning just a repeat of the same conversation, the same details, just with drawing out the detail. So I would say no, that um, Genesis is not dealing with cosmological creation simply because I don't believe that would have been a, um, would have been a thought for the original audience. Again, they would have already understood that their deity, whatever deity it was in that ancient Near Eastern region, created everything. So that wouldn't have been something that needed to be answered. And then, no, I do not place Adam as the first biological or, you know, actual person to be on this planet. I would say that Adam is the first man to be brought into covenant relationship with the God of Israel, or the true God as, you know, is being relayed to Adam. And the reason why I would, I would say that is, obviously, as I alluded to earlier, with the darkness in Genesis 1 and 2, there was darkness in that region, and, and simply, I just believe, scientifically, if you were to go back 6,000 years, if we were to say, you know, or, you know, understanding that that was written and then it was later, that you still don't arrive at a, a date that I think that uh, man was, was placed on the planet. So, again, I just think that that's foreign concept from creation. Thanks. All right, and I guess I get to ask you a question. You do. All right. <laughs> um, so, I, Pastor Robert, I appreciated your uh, presentation on creation, and uh, I'm glad to see a lot more uh, unity in our presentation than I, I had a the previously thought. So what I will ask is obviously the one area where we do have a difference is are you saying that the reason we biologically die today is due to the fall of Adam? I, I believe that, our, that death was not God's original intention. I do not, I believe the capability of death was built into man in terms of, in other words, he is not granted immortality upon creation. 
He's granted immortality upon fellowship, upon, upon the communion and sustained aspect of God's of relationship with God. But because that relationship is not sustained, but it's broken by the fall, and he's severed from that access, uh, in the severing of that abscess, there's a consequence. And the consequence uh, taints not only his body, but all of creation. And so um, part of uh, get, getting ahead of myself, when we talk, if we ever reach the end tonight, when we reach the end tonight, I believe part of the redemptive activity of God is the restorations of a new heaven and a new earth, not just covenantally, but even, even in, a, in, a, in a more material dimension. So. How about your pen? <laughs> My pen died. If anybody wants to throw a pen up here, that'd be appreciated. Thank you. Girls too. All right. We could go back and forth just on this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing so far? All right. Hey, how's your, how's your moderator doing? Pretty good? Yeah. No. <laughs> at, at least we like to laugh. It's good that it's not, you know, too serious. Because it's a pretty serious topic. If we don't have, you know, a pause, we might be, you know, I don't know, go cross-eyed from thinking too much. Anyhow, section two is on the purpose and significance of the law and the prophets. And this one, we'll cut them a little bit shorter. This one, only eight minutes each. But Pastor Robert will go first this time. The, the hardest part is the time constraints. Okay. Lower and the prophets. So God, we have what we all are familiar with as the old covenant. God, in this progressive revelation and action of redemption, provides... The books of the Bible, 39 books, which involve the, what we call the Old Covenant. This alludes to the unity of the Bible, which means to us here tonight that Scripture is much more than just a storehouse of facts or truths to be randomly selected or haphazardly applied. In other words, it's not like when you first came to know Christ and you bought the promise box in the local Christian bookstore and you pulled out one and that was what God was saying to you that day like a fortune cookie. The Bible is much more comprehensive and cohesive than that. It's not just a hodgepodge of information and a muddled mess. There's an aim and a purpose in it from its opening book to its closing words. There's a, there's a, a line of thought and purpose and intention that God is aiming at. And so that connection is, uh, is all found in the unity of these covenants, the eternal plan of creation and redemption. Redemption. I have a book in my library called The Unfolding Drama of Redemption. That is that God's actions are rooted in history and unfolding in time, from creation to consummation. Again, kingdom through covenant. God is reclaiming his kingdom through the means of covenant. Many covenants there are, but they're all unified by the singular concept of covenant, and that is a claiming or a reclaiming of a people. A reclaiming or a, recla uh, or a, claiming or a reclaiming of creation through divine agreements and promises. And these divine agreements and promises, promises unfold. Uh, the, unity, the many covenants in the Old Testament are combined to form what we call the Old Covenant. Uh, I think Basically, we think in terms of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. What makes the Old Covenant dramatically distinctive from the New Covenant is that the Old Covenant consists largely, is, the Old Covenant is largely human dependent. It largely depends on an action on our part. It largely depends on participation. And I can emphasize the word largely depends upon our end. Is the conditional element in the Old Covenant is very strong. God chooses out a people, Israel, and they are to be his image bearers. They are to be his vice regents. They are really like a type of Adam now. The, the new head of which he's, uh, as a corporate body, the head of which he's going to use to be his image bearers and his vice regents and his agents. But the trouble and the reality is that God's saving agents need saving themselves. And, uh, and with the exception, I would say, of the Abrahamic covenant. 
When you read the Abrahamic covenant, you see that the Abrahamic covenant is more of a foundational covenant. It's a unilateral covenant. It's more comprehensive in that it, it, lacks, it lacks conditions, really. It's a statement from beginning to end of what God is going to do. It's more of a proclamation and a declaration to Abraham uh, from, a, from a more panoramic view of everything, ultimately, that God is going to accomplish. And out of that, he forms Israel and so on and so forth. And, and, and we have all the old covenant. But I think the Abrahamic covenant is important and singular in that regard that it's really a covenant of promises. It's called, we call that monothetic, where God singularly acts, where God uh, takes control of it himself, makes a pledge of what he will do and what he will accomplish. But human failure uh, is always met in the Old Testament with divine faithfulness. And, and that's, I think that's, that's the scheme of the old covenant. Man keeps failing, but God doesn't fail. God doesn't quit. God, God's, God nearly destroys it, but he doesn't destroy it. He, he, he's nearly had it, but he hasn't had it. He's going to fulfill his plan. He's going to have a kingdom. He's going to have a people. He's going to fulfill his purposes. He's going to glorify his name. And the Mosaic covenant, but the Mosaic covenant, you see, is addressed to man in sin. Man is fickle. God is faithful. In God's faithfulness, he provides within this covenant, which consists in a lot of responsibility, he provides a sacrificial system. The sacrificial system is a system of, although we know it now to be types and shadows, it's all a picture of what he will one day do, but it's a temporary provision. It's a temporary, uh, tangible uh, promise and pledge. It's impossible for these bulls and goats to take away sin, and yet they give the promise and the hope that is to be embraced, though it be afar off, that sin will be forgiven, sin will be eradicated, sin will be removed. My point tonight is that all the variations, advances, alterations, provisions under the Old Covenant could never warrant the title new. We must wait another day until the Old Covenant is superseded by the New Covenant. I see the Old Covenant really or the, as really, uh, I see the Law of Mosaic Covenant, I see it really as a parenthesis. I, I like that when I studied this out and I thought of this because, you know, I'm not of those who see the church as a parenthesis. And there are groups that, you know, we know them. They see the church as God's parentheses, where he loves Israel, he's, he's, he's embraced Israel, now we're this parenthesis, and he's going back to Israel. I don't see that at all. I see, if anything, Israel as a parenthesis. I see the old covenant as a parenthesis. Galatians 3 says the law was added. It came in alongside because of transgressions. Now, I want to give a little illustration. I'm running out of time. A little illustration here. I love this. When I, when I preached once on this law being added, I used the illustration of a service road. You know, the service road along the expressway? This is what a service road, a service road, what's, what, why does a service road exist? It exists to give you access to the highway. It exists to bring you to the next ramp on. And, 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 and if you use the service road or right, you will get on the highway. But if you use the service road or wrong, you'll stay on it, and eventually it'll veer away from the highway. And I think that's really what happened. The, the law was given as a schoolmaster to bring people to Christ. It was a schoolmaster to draw their focus to the need of all that the sacrificial system typified, all that it represented, that they needed a savior, that they needed help, that they needed a redeemer. But instead, by Jesus' day especially, this law, this service road had been stayed on. It had veered away from its purpose. It had become a system of righteousness in itself. It had become uh, that which was meant to bring them on the highway has taken them on a detour. It has taken them on another road altogether. The law is a wonderful schoolmaster, but it is a terrible taskmaster. It bids us to make bricks, but it gives us no straw. And, uh, and, and while it was intended to lead to Christ, it actually uh, can have a danger in it, inherent in it, and that is when it's misused uh, in its purposes, can actually lead people away from Christ. I say that the law was not a divine experimentation. It was, a need, it was needed for human experience. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, which means there was something that had to happen. God chose in his wisdom, in, in, in his knowledge, which supersedes, supersedes ours, God said these 1,500 and so years needed to transpire where man gets every inkling of self-saving hope 
knocked the hell out of him, if I could say that. And, uh, and, 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 and so, and, and so no more leaning, I preach like that. So no more leaning on their own righteousness. No more looking to anything but Jehovah. No more uh, leaning on the arm of flesh, but trained in desperation to look away. Men were saved under the old covenant, but they were not saved by it. They were saved by its provision, this by representation through the sacrificial system. God must save. And the prophets keep calling people back, but in calling them back, they also know that the real hope didn't lie in calling them back. The real hope lied in the promise of what was to come. I'm like preaching. <laughs> I can't help <laughs> I can sure learn a lot about using great analogies. Amen. Uh, well, in my opening presentation about creation, I, I sought to lay before you that Genesis is serving as a microcosm, a smaller example of what God is going to do with Israel through the Law and the Prophets. They would call this, as Pastor Robert mentioned, the archetypal view. And this would be the frame that I approach the Bible with, is that I approach the Bible understanding that God has now created a covenant relationship with his people. We see various creation accounts happening throughout our Bible. For example, and if you're taking notes, I would urge you to write these, ones, these verses down, would be Deuteronomy chapter 32, Jeremiah chapter 4, Isaiah chapter 49, Isaiah chapter 51, as well as Hebrews chapter 1. And why I brought those before you is because you see the term heaven and earth being used in all of those passages. And I would present to you that heaven and earth is a covenant phrase. And that's going to carry forward my discussion into the Mosaic Law. We see the creation aspects used throughout the entire New Testament in reference to God's people. We know that in 1 Corinthians 15 we read that first comes the natural, then comes the spiritual. When we read all the way up to, if one of the things I've been doing here at Blue Point is bringing our church all the way from Genesis chapter 1, and we ended last week at Exodus chapter 2, verse 25. And in Exodus chapter 2, verse 25, I believe is where you begin the Law and the Prophets. And that's where it says that God looked upon Israel, saw them in distress, you know, in Egypt, and was going to comfort them. Now, God is reaching out, showing that grace, as Pastor Robert very well presented with the Law and the Prophets, that it was a grace to Israel. Now, one of the things I've mentioned in discussion with Pastor Robert as well as with my congregation is that I have a problem with starting the covenant with, of Israel with Abraham. Because I believe that if you were to take the lineage and you were to trace it back from Abraham to Adam, you would very well see that that traces right back to Adam. Meaning, Abraham is the son of Shem, trace it back. Shem is the son of Noah, Noah is the son of somebody, and that traces back to... Uh, <laughs> traces back to... Abram, and then it traces back, so on and so forth, to Seth. So, I say all that to, uh, the, what I want to start with in this presentation is that I, I don't want us to put ourselves in the text yet. I want you to draw out the meaning of what God is doing with Israel, and then we're going to find ourselves in that application. The Mosaic Covenant, I, I believe, is uh, illustrated in that covenant creation story in the beginning. Now, what I would say is, the Mosaic Covenant, as you see, Pastor Robert mentioned the Abrahamic Covenant. I would say that the Abra Abrahamic Covenant was being continued or matured in the covenant of Moses. And I would present Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, where it says, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. But my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. So you see a progression happening here with the Mosaic Covenant. In Galatians chapter 3, I, I very much love the analogy of uh, the, you know, the service road and the highway. I agree. The law was meant to lead his people. I would ask you all tonight to think about who the law was given to, that it was meant to lead his people to Jesus. And I say that to bring you to a couple passages in the book of Psalms, I'm going to start out with Psalm chapter 78, verse 5. I like to go through my Bible, so that's why I didn't write the verses down. Psalm 78, verse... Five, and you read this. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. In Psalm 103, verse 7, Psalm 
We read, he made his ways known to Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. In Psalm 147, verse 19, He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and judgments unto Israel. Continuing into verse 20. He has not dealt so with any nation, and for his judgments they have not known them. Praise the Lord. So what you see established thus far is that God is dealing with Jacob under the law, the tribes of Israel under the law, whereas where are the other nations? Again, if you remember what I mentioned in Genesis, I believe the other nations are outside covenant. They are stuck in darkness and idolatry, worshiping false gods. Amen. So now... You have the gospel being made known only to Jacob. And if I may give you one more verse, it would be Romans chapter 3, verse 2. As well as Romans chapter 9, the Apostle Paul begins to say that the promises had only been given to our fathers, drawing a distinction between Israel and those that were outside of covenant with God. For example, in Ephesians chapter 2, it tells you that the Gentiles were in the world without hope and without God. So many times... In the New Testament, we, we find clarity in regards to Old Testament passages. We must allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Apostle Paul clarifies in many places about how Israel was exclusive to God. Israel was under law. Israel was dead in Adam. I know many people will uh, posit that all of us are in Adam, and that will be a question that will come up at, possibly after this discussion. Um, in Romans 5, I would say that I find issue with everybody being in Adam, because I believe Moses is mentioned in the text that death reigned from Adam unto Moses and thus putting those that were in Adam in Moses and there were others who did not sin in the likeness of Adam. Obviously the idolatry of that pagan culture. Adam violated a law from God. The pagans, they were just stuck in darkness, not given any opportunity to even have a covenant relationship with God to disobey. Therefore, the death that Adam suffered under the law, the law of sin and death drawn out in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8, would have been a law that was exclusive to Israel, would have been a death that was exclusive to Israel under law. In Romans chapter 7, again, they mentioned that there were others who did not sin in the likeness of Adam. And I believe when the Apostle Paul continues into Romans chapter 9, he's establishing that the promises were made to our forefathers, Israel. But then he continues into Romans chapter 15 and he says, the Gentiles will glorify God because he will fulfill his promises to Israel. You see, that is the context that what is happening in the law of Moses is the law of Moses was given to Israel. They were in Adam. They were established as broken, covered by God in Adam. However, God is going to promise something in the future, something that had not been made known to the generations prior, as mentioned in the book of Ephesians, as mentioned in many places in our Bible. If you read through 2 Corinthians chapters 3 through 5, you find a shifting of covenants. You find the old covenant where Israel was in, and one of the interesting things in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that the Apostle Paul says is he says that this is bringing death in us, but life in you. So now if he's putting us in Adam... Who's you? I would say it's the Gentiles. Israel was dying during that first century period when Christ's ministry was coming. They were seeing that the law was a faulty tutor. Yeah. It, was, it was leading them to Jesus. However, it was not righteousness, as Pastor Robert very well said. So, you have Israel failing to live up to the image of God, Israel facing death, but Jesus is going to bring about the true image of God Amen. in that new covenant period. Amen. So, again, I would posit that that old covenant, that Mosaic covenant, was a fulfillment of the covenants from Adam to Moses and now is only exclusive to Israel, bringing a death in Israel that is going to be a, bring life through the Messiah, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. And I get to ask the first question, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, I'm excited about that one. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pastor Robert, in your discussion, you had mentioned about the law, law being a faulty tutor to lead us mm -hmm. to Jesus. And I agree with you. However, I would ask that, would you say that all of us are under that, are all of us in Adam? Are all of us under that law of sin and death? Or was that something that was exclusive to Israel? I, I, I would agree um, Well, I'll say it this way. I believe that the original intent was 
God chose a people. He specifically says, I chose them not because they're great. I've chosen them because they're the least of the least, and I'll show myself great. So he chooses the nation of Israel. The aim and goal of the choosing the nation of Israel is to be a light to the world. It is to not to contain, stay contained within Israel, but to be, to as you said, to declare who the true and real God is to the rest of the earth. Yes, Paul's uh, references in Galatians 3 to the law being a schoolmaster was certainly limited to the people of God. It was certainly uh, limited because the others didn't have that law. How could it be a schoolmaster? It's a schoolmaster only to those to whom it was given. It was only given to the covenant people of God. It was only given to Israel. Uh, that does not mean that those, those, those who were outside the covenant are lost as well. They are, they, they are, they are, they are lost. This, uh, the, the hope for them is the light that Israel will bring, not the light that the law will bring. Does that answer? Yeah, thank you. Good. Um, boy. Uh, <laughs> we can pick on a few here. Uh, let me, give me two seconds. Just develop a little bit more. Uh, develop a little bit more. Um, see, I would I would say that when he says death reigned between Adam and Moses in, in Romans five, uh, that in other words, even bef I would say that that what that signifies is that even those who were without the law already were dying. And they were dying because of their connection to Adam. Not because of their connection to Moses. So it's not only those who are connected to Moses that are dying, but it's those who sinned without any direct law from God. Or not only their connection to Adam who sinned from a direct law from God, but even those who, who did not sin. He, the whole argument of Romans 5, isn't it about, about unity... With Ad, I see it as unity with Adam, and because of unity with Adam, this, this penalty comes upon all mankind. And so therefore, even those who didn't sin in a direct fashion as Adam sinned, still receive, and, and just kind of re-explain what you were saying, how being limited. All right. You understood what I said? Yes. <laughs> well, obviously it's all before us that I believe in a very limited view of what God is doing in the law of Moses and in creation. I, I hope that I've ex exemplified that pretty well at this point, that I'm limiting the view of what God is doing here to Israel, right? Creation of Israel, obviously that co covenant creation, and then now God is dealing with Israel through the law of Moses. So here in Romans chapter, first I'm just going to start with uh, kind of giving you an overview of the book mm -hmm. of Romans. And what I would say is that when the Apostle Paul is writing to a large majority of the churches in that first century period, whether it's the church at Corinth, the church at Rome, the church at Thessalonica, what he's writing is to correct the issues of that time period. Again, not answering our questions, you know, again, not forcing ourselves into the text. So what was the major problem during that first century period? And what you had was you had those Judaizers coming around and saying you must submit to the law. You must be circumcised as the covenant with Abraham. You must do all these religious obligations to fulfill you know, the righteousness in Christ. Even as a Christian, they were saying that. They were preaching that to the church. That's why the Apostle Paul is writing to the church. He's telling the church, do not be misled. Do not go back to the law of Moses. You know, do, not, do not be misled by all this confusion. So establishing that with Romans, I do believe that it's it, within, uh, obviously, some historical context would be that after Claudius had expelled the Jews from Rome in that first century period, now he's invited them back. And we see, if we do the historical research, that in Rome, in that region, there was an influx of a Jewish population. And the reason why I say that is because for a long time, and, and possibly many of you have heard this, is that when we open up you know, to Romans, to Corinth, we always hear, oh, he's writing to the Gentiles. However, in Rome, there would have been a large population of Jews at that time. And obviously, the Gentiles would have knew nothing of the law. They would have, you know, you wouldn't quote the law to a Gentile. It wouldn't have compelled them to much. They would have said nothing. So the reason I, I draw out all that explanation would be that in Romans 5, if I may just read a couple of verses here, he says, 
Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, I would, I would posit that as a covenantal world there, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Adam was given a law. His law was that he could not eat of any other tree. So, Adam was under law. Therefore, the death of Adam had to be under law. And therefore, that is, again, I, I see that that's why, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him who was to come, but not as the offense, but also as the free gift, and obviously showing all is going to be consummated in Christ. One of the problems I have with putting all in Adam is that it says here in Romans 5.18, but if one man, by, I'm sorry, I'll start at verse 17. But if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Again, I don't see all, I see many. You see, many being made sinners, many being made righteous, right here in our text. And I do believe that if we end up forcing, is something that I, you know, one of my areas of study, would be that if we put everybody in Adam, we end up putting everybody in Jesus. And to me, that's a problem, that you know, I, I wouldn't allow for that understanding. And again, just to end my, my point here, would be that I would interpret the world of Romans as I interpreted Genesis. I would have to follow the full flow of the story. That's why we're sitting here going from creation to the law of Moses. I would follow that story, and I wish I could read to you from Exodus to uh, you know, Romans and show you the context that I'm seeking to relay before you. However, I would say that what we must do is we must read through the entire corpus of Scripture and find out who was really in Adam. I believe that's important. And when we do that, we'll be able to find what the answer is. And if I may give you a, just a simple parable, the parable of the um, prodigal son. You know that it would have been a servant would have, you know, Israel was the servants of God under the law, right? And you had the Gentiles, they were not in the house of the father. They, they, only Israel was serving the Lord. However, we know that in Romans 8, what, what's going to happen is the manifestation of the sons of God. So you have three components of the prodigal son. You have those that are in the house, right, that are servants. You have those that are outside the house that aren't servants. And you have those that are going to be made sons. I would say that Adam, those in Adam, were the servants that were serving in the house of God under the old covenant. And through Jesus, as you said, the unifying factor, they're unifying that all men would share in, the, in Christ. He would compel some that were outside the house, and he would compel some that were servants within the house to come to be the sons of God. Amen. Gotcha. Right. At this time, we'll just take a 15-minute intermission. Break. Cool. Just so we we'll take a little break. There's a lot of stuff to digest, think about, stand up, stretch out, walk around, check out the basketball score, whatever. You Welcome yeah, back. Good. Did you get everything out of your system? You have a donut, some coffee. You're wired up. Checked out the basketball score. All right. Yeah. I was a little bummed out, but that's for another time. I just wanted to say I'm really excited and thankful for this night and for everything that these two great men of God have been sharing and you know there's a lot of study sometimes it we can harp on oh you know they didn't have the right reference or they misspoke or he couldn't remember somebody's name <laughs> the kinds of things that they've been studying and pouring their just hearts and lives and time truthfully into I think that it's pretty remarkable and I think that we should just take a second this is on my account, not theirs. But let's just acknowledge it for a moment. Is anyone blessed tonight? Amen. Anyone blessed? Pretty unanimous. So that's, that's pretty neat, pretty unanimous. But what I wanted to say is, we're calling this a debate, and it's a de debate in terms of the flow and the setup and the structure of it. But it's not like other debates. In this debate, there's no winner and there's no loser. In this debate, it's not about who can make the other one look worse or bad or anything like that. It's about bringing light to the scriptures. It's about going on a quest and encountering God through His Word and really finding who He is. And Proverbs 27, 17 says that iron sharpens iron. So a man also to another one, his friend. But what I think is really brought out 
in that verse, in that scripture, what really brings it to life is what Matthew Henry said of it. He said, to direct us what we must have in our eye in conversation, namely to improve both others and ourselves, not to pass away time or banter one another, but to provoke one another to love and to good works, and so to make one another wiser and better. And the point of all of this is not about who has more knowledge or who's proven to be better, but if we don't all love greater, if we don't all serve God better and Amen. fuller as a result, it's really profitless nothing. Amen. So I just want to throw that out there to you, free of charge, you know, kind of get it in your mind. And as we approach, as we approach the second half of this and things really start to crank up, I think they're really just warming up and so I want to get out of the way and let them get in the way, but let's keep that in our minds and in our hearts. So part three is the mission and the message of Jesus. Again, this one will be eight minutes apiece and then some questions and Pastor Robert will start this one off, so. Alrighty. The ministry of Jesus. The ministry of Jesus is founded upon the failure of man and the faithfulness of God. One of my favorite verses is really not about Jesus, but about his forerunner, John the Baptist. John 1 and 6 says, There came a man sent from God, his name is John. Jesus said he was the greatest among men, yet that he that was least in the kingdom was greater than he. Because John stood on the brink of the kingdom. John stood in the place of announcement that the king was coming. So John stood outside this new dimension of the kingdom. And Jesus says, we who are on the other side are at such an advantage. Not that we're greater than John in person, but we're greater than John in privilege. But the key, so the keynote of the ministry of Jesus is the great strides that the fulfillment of the kingdom takes. In the arrival of Jesus, there's an unprecedented successful advance of the kingdom of God. And the glory of God is being restored. And glory to God is being restored in new dimensions and proportions. It all begins with the glory of his person. He is the true Israel. He's the true vine. He's the true servant. In all the areas they failed, he is that. He is David's greatest son. He is the singular seed of, of Abraham. He is the uh, singular seed that will result in blessing all nations. He's the savior of mankind by his very name, Jesus. God so acts in Jesus in such a dynamic and glorious way that it, it, it's so new, it's so awesome, it's so wonderful. And while it's a continuum and a fulfillment of the old covenant while it is an advancement of it it is so radically different or so radically advanced and so radically new that it's given the name new covenant and in that sense it's so superior to the old so supersedes the old that it actually abolishes it by its fulfillment um, I do want to say insert here that Jesus came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I know in a little discussion, Pastor Michael is going to talk more about this. But I will say this, that Jesus comes, why does he come to the Jewish people? The goal is the whole earth. But why does he come to the Jewish people? Because unto them was given the covenants. Because they had a no embodiment of the, knowledge, of the knowledge of God, at least in scripture fashion. Because those were the ones God was working with and he was going to continue to give opportunity to through this kingdom through covenant concept. Uh, to simply put, to put it simply, um, something radically new though is happening in the new covenant. Now theologically, the storyline of scripture is founded in two individuals. In Adam and in Christ. And so Adam is the head of the old order. Adam's the, the head of all sin. Adam is the head of, of that, which, uh, that which has come before, and Christ is the head of this new creation. It's interesting that Scripture, we, we often call Adam, Jesus the second Adam. The Bible, not that I know of, ever says that. It calls him the last Adam. 
because in a sense there were other typo typological atoms. Noah was a kind of atom. Uh, we could go through the Bible and show other kinds of heads. But Adam is the first primary head and Jesus is the last and final and uh, that's a head of the new covenant. It's called a new and an everlasting covenant because we don't need any more. We don't need any revisions. We don't need any improvements. We don't need any new heads. Oh, he is it. All that we need. God who had, I love Hebrews 1, God who at sundry times and in, in times past in divers manners has spoken through the prophets in various means and measures and so hath in these last days in a final sense spoken unto us, visited us in the person of his son. In the ministry of Jesus, the eschatological uh, is a culmination of, uh, of the eschatological dealing, the end time dealings of God. The end of the age is beginning to come to pass in the person of Jesus Christ. This is what I, uh, the kingdom of God is, is being experienced in a, in a new proportion, a new, a new element of reign and rule or reign and realm. I believe this is what the scriptures allude to when they talk about the mystery of the kingdom. Matthew 13 records the parables that are called the mystery of the kingdom. Parables. That's also Mark 4, Luke 8. What is the mystery of the kingdom? The mystery of the kingdom is unlike they expected. Unlike a kingdom that comes in a single shot with Messiah and does it all in an instant. The kingdom that comes in Messiah is a kingdom that comes in dynamic fulfillment without consummation. It comes in, in inauguration, visitation, arrival, but without a full manifestation of all its proportions. It comes in fulfillment without a glorification. So we have here uh, this age, and I say this age represents life as it is before Christ. Life under the, under life, this age represents life apart from Christ. Life, life under, the, under the fall and the curse of the fall. So this age, this present evil age, as Paul refers to it, is existing. And while it's existing, the, the one who comes bringing the age to come invades this age. I, I just think everybody needs to get this. This age continues, and yet the age to come has intercepted it. But in coming, this age to come, coming in, doesn't do away with this age. This age continues while the age to come is, 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 has, has broken in upon it. Now there's coming a time. There's coming a time in the future of the story where this age ends. And the age to come is all that is left. But right now, well, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but right now, in my estimation of Scripture, this age continues as the age to come infiltrates and invades and sits atop it, if you will. See, this is my graph. <laughs> How's that for the video? <laughs> oh, I'm wasting my time. <laughs> so redemption without consummation, already and a not yet of the kingdom, and now and it to come. Uh, George Ladd's great, great, the presence of the future. The presence of the future, an inaugurated eschatology. That, that is that in the Old Testament it was prophetic foreshortening where all the prophecies were blended into a single event but now they're, now they're, now they're protracted, now they're, now they're taken out of this single statement and they're extended. And while the Old in many of the prophecies there's no distinction between inauguration and consummation, in the New Testament we begin to see a distinction between the coming of the kingdom and the consummation of the kingdom. I believe the miracles and signs and wonders of Jesus were not merely attestations to his person. They were not just vindications to who he was, but they were actually extensions. They were actually extensions of the kingdom attacking the ill effects of sin and evil. They were actually a... A, a, the age to come invading this age with its powers, bringing prompt future promises into the present. Uh, I, I think every time Jesus heals somebody, that's what's happening. Uh, I, I, okay, lastly, so lastly, I, I think I'll, I'll give you one verse where I see a blending. Matthew 16, verse 26. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, loses his own soul? 
And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And Jen Jesus says in Matthew 16, 27, the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. I see that as a reference to the consummation of the age. I see that to be, be that line where this age ends and the new age alone is left. I see that to represent the ultimate consummation of the age. And then the next verse, verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And I take that to me a more immediate coming. See, I see many comings of Christ. I see many comings of Christ. I don't, we, we call it, the, you know, I know Pastor Michael might not, but we, our ranks generally call it the second coming. But I see many comings of Christ and a final coming. Day of Pentecost was a coming. Amen. Because didn't he say in John 14, I'll come again? He didn't just say the Holy Spirit will come. He said, I will come. And he says it in reference to the coming of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so the coming of the, the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, was a coming of Jesus in the person of the Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, it was a dynamic dimension of the kingdom of God. And my time is up. So I don't care if you take verse 28. There be some standing here that shall not taste of death, death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I don't care if you take that to refer to the transfiguration just eight days later, which is a little fluky, or to take it to refer to Pentecost with the blessings of his coming. Some of you are going to experience my, me from, coming from my kingdom. And then, or if you take it A.D. 70, a coming in judgment. But I still don't think it's the consummation, the reference to the confirmation that proceeds coming in the glory of his father with his angels and the judgment Coming, the, the judgment that are going to decide who's losing their soul and who's gaining a, an eternal, eternal union with him. Done. <laughs> There's my eight cents. Get it? <laughs> that joke. <laughs> I won't take jokes, though. I'll take the analogies. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to take you back on a journey through the, back into the Old Testament again to continue this contextual story that I'm trying to guide you through. If you, you go back now, we, we started with Israel. I, I've obviously set before you um, Exodus chapter 2, verse 25. To me, that I believe that is the beginning of that Old Covenant. And if you do, a, you do pick up your Bible and you begin to read from Exodus chapter 2, verse 25, you could go ahead and read all the way to Revelation, and you're going to find that God had an exclusive relationship with Israel. Now, what ends up happening in that Old Covenant with Israel is if you pick up the book of First and Second Kings, or First and Second Chronicles, whichever one you like, you begin to see how they divide. That you end up having two tribes stay in the south and they're, they're loyal to the Lord. Those are the, um, the tribes of Judah or the tribes of Israel. I'm sorry, the tribes of Judah. And then in the north, you're going to have the dispersed tribes of the, you know, the scattered ones, the, the lost tribes that are going to go to the north. And ten tribes were a part of those scattered tribes, the lost tribes of Israel. And you would imagine if God is creating a covenant with these people and he wants them to be united. He wants them to be his people to represent his will before the earth. Now, if I may... I'm going to bring you to Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6. And here the Lord begins a promise. Now he's, he's, he's promising Israel something. He says this. I'm going to actually start at verse 5. Isaiah 49, verse 5 reads, And now says the Lord that formed me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob again to him, through, though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorified in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, It is a light thing that thou should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou may, may be my salvation unto the end of the earth. So what, I, what I'm explaining to you at this point is now God is promising that he's going to include those Gentiles. So as I've tried to relay the story before you through Genesis and through the Mosaic Covenant, is that God has that exclusive relationship with Israel. I would not put myself into that relationship with Israel. I would say that here begins good news. 
Now I can find my place. God is going to reach out to the Gentiles and bring them as well into the salvation, that relationship, that covering that Israel had enjoyed in that garden relationship or that covered relationship with the Lord. And if you want to see more about covering, I heard somebody relay that, that it's about changing clothes. And you can see in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 through 5 that that old covenant is changing its clothes to put on the new covenant. So the ministry of Jesus. In John chapter 10... Jesus is very clear that he must do the work of the Father, and he's telling you to judge him by the work of the Father, that if I do the work of the Father, I am him who was sent. If I do not do the work of the Father, then I am not him. So, obviously, the beginning of our study would be, well, what was the work of the Father, and did he do the work of the Father? Obviously, in 1 John chapter 5, you read that Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil. Now, if I can turn to, well, I'm going to turn to Luke chapter 2. And I'm going to read you what Luke says about the coming of Jesus into the world, the incarnation, something that we know Jesus was coming to, to bring this glorious good news, as Pastor Robert had alluded to. In Luke chapter 2, verse... Sorry, Luke chapter 2, verse 25. I'm going to start reading there. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. That he had came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed the Lord and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to the Gentiles and glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the falling and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. So what did Jesus do? He came to be the consolation of Israel, to unite Israel to the lost tribes of Israel, and he came to be a light to the Gentiles. Now the Gentile nations will have a place in this covenant that God has established with his, exclusively with the tribes of Jacob. Obviously, we, we agree on Jesus coming to undo the work of Adam. And uh, we, we've talked about that. And uh, Jesus comes to, you know, Adam died. Jesus comes to bring life. I would incorporate that into the Mosaic Covenant and say that that death that Israel suffered was that covenantal death that Adam suffered when he ate of the tree that day and he was ashamed and, you know, he didn't have that free relationship that he had with the Father at that moment. I believe that is also what is being related in 1 Corinthians 15, that Israel is going to be raised up. And then when God raises up Israel, now... The Gentile people will be incorporated in the story. They can trust in this faithful God who has indeed fulfilled the promises to Israel. Again, remembering that I put before you all that Romans 9 says that the Apostle Paul is preaching the covenants and the promise that were given to Israel. So I believe that Jesus was incarnated into that world of Israel. You know, for God so loved the world. Again, the context of that passage is that God so loved his people Israel. And he's coming to fix Israel, as Simeon is noting here. That God is going to come to be the consolation of Israel. A light to the Gentiles, but again, remembering Ephesians, that the Gentiles were in the world without God, without hope. John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. John chapter 12, verse 46, I have come as light into the world, that whoever believes in me shall not abide in darkness. Again, I don't believe this is talking about people living outside at night. This is talking about people living in confusion. Again, bringing you all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the, con the darkness that was over the face of the deep. There was darkness in the land. And also you can use 1 Thessalonians 5 as a reference point that you are not called to be the children of the night that you should dwell in darkness but you are called to be the children of the day that you should dwell in the light again you see light as a metaphor here for clarity not confusion so we all know what light is depending depending on it today so we will not stumble in the dark this is why the gospel is associated with light again bringing restoring israel and bringing a light out to the Gentiles. But even if our gospel is veiled the apostle paul says it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 6, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. The light is his word and his way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
To come to the Father, we must come through Jesus Christ. John the Apostle writes that Jesus was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Well, some did in the world know him, so clearly the world there is not talking about everybody on the planet. The world there is talking about those that were of that covenant world that were disobedient to him, were not seeing him, and then obviously there were those that were in that world that were seeing the fact that Jesus was the truth. The Apostle Paul brings the message to the Gentiles. That's where the story begins to incorporate Gentiles into the story. Again, there was a promise from the beginning. I do not want to ever make anybody think that I don't believe God had his eyes set on each and every one of you from the foundations of the world. He had his hope for the Gentiles. However, the story begins with Israel. We Remember, to the Jew first, then to the Gentile, Romans 1.16. So, I'll just simply say that I believe that Christ was fulfilling that mystery. The mystery was, how will the Gentiles come to share in the promises of God? If all of it is Israel, and many people will ask me this, well then, how do you put us in the text? Here's where it begins. Jesus. Okay, good clap. <laughs> I, I would have rather listened a little longer than uh, even have a question. I... Um, <clears throat> Just sometimes I get confused with interchanging some of the terms, like world, because sometimes it seems that you're using world to depict God's people, and other times it seems like you're doing the very opposite. True? Um, again, I, I think that the, the answer to that would be that uh, there are many words in your Bible that are translated as world. Again, you have um, oikomune, which is the Greek term for the known world, which would have been the Roman Empire at that time from Jerusalem to Rome. You have the term cosmos, which doesn't actually mean earth as many people would translate in your Bible. It simply means the orderly arrangement. And then you have gi, which can also mean earth or it could mean land. You know, one of the things I make in the Old Testament is it says that Abraham left the face of the earth to go to the other face of the earth now, or to another land, to another earth. Um, the term there would be arets in Hebrew, which is the Greek equivalent would be gi, as we find many times. So the reason why I might change around words would be in the context, they might be a little different. But if I may just read from John chapter 1, and I'll illustrate one of the points I was making about the world here. In John chapter 1, uh, obviously, I'm sure this is familiar to everybody in the room. I hope John 1 is a familiar text to all of us. Um, I know some that would love the deity of Christ being clearly displayed in John chapter 1. Here it says, All things were made by him, starting in verse 3, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, life was the light of men, and the light shines into the darkness, darkness comprehends it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came as a witness to bear witness to the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So you see right there the covenantal world that was rejecting Jesus rather than being the entire planet. I get a question, right? Yep. My question would be, you, you talked a bit about the age, mm -hmm. um, the two ages. Again, I, I would posit, I'm not sure if we're in agreement there, that there would be uh, two ages in the Jewish perspective. You have the present, actually you mentioned that, the present evil age mm -hmm. and the age to come. Are we living in the present evil age or are we living in the age to come? We are in this world, but not of it. Which means, <clears throat> which means, he doesn't take us from it. See, the present evil, evil age continues. It's round about us. We are, we are in the midst of it. And yet, we are born from a, being born from above. We are already citizens. We are already partakers of the powers of the age to come. We are already, already inaugurated because the kingdom's inaugurated. It's a reign of the kingdom, 
without a realm of the kingdom. Or, the, or the, let's say the realm is not fully realized yet. Because when the realm is fully realized, this age will be no more. But this age continues while the age to come comes. I do not see, if you, this might help, because I know on just our little, we've had private conversations, and I don't see this age as referring to the Old Covenant. I see this age as referring to this present evil age, age dominated, an age ruled by sin, an age ruled by distance from God, an age ruled by separation. That's, that's what I generally see this age as. So this age continues. We are of the age to come, and yet we still live in this world and in this earth as it is. So the two, the two are, are, are both existent. It's not one or the other. It's not mutually exclusive. It's both and. My graph. <laughs> 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 Who needs technology when you have graphs like that? I mean, these people with their charts, we don't need them. Oh, we're coming into the last section here, and fittingly, it's the end of all things or eschatology. We're going to go 12 minutes each on this one and we'll let Pastor Michael go first. How are you guys feeling on time? You alright? Yeah. Ready to stay? Should we give them 13 minutes? Uh, I didn't hear any excitement. We'll stick with 12. All right, my favorite topic. Here I go. Well, they, I had once heard somebody say that the new kid on the block, you know, uh, in dealing with eschatology, my position may be somewhat new to many of you, and uh, they say the new kid on the block must uh, display his view first in order to uh, show what I'm talking about here. In Revelation chapter 21, we read this, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Unto me, write, for these words are trustworthy and faithful. What we see as we read through Revelation chapter 20 through 21 is we begin to see a decreation of what we read in Genesis chapter 1. Again, you see here there's no sea. In Genesis there was a sea, here there's no sea. There's a lot of connotation to understanding what the sea is in Scripture. You can go to the book of 1 Kings and you'll read that King Ahaz moved the sea. That was kind of odd to me when I first picked up my Bible. I said, hey, wait, Ahaz moved the sea. Well, that must have been a mighty man. But then I came to understand that the sea was actually the, the washing basin that Ahaz, the, people, the Jews that would go into the temple, they would have to wash their hands. And that would be the purifying aspect of being allowed to enter into the temple. So, as I mentioned in the beginning, heaven and earth should bring us to understand from the context of the original audience, temple. Again, Josephus, if you were to read the first century Jewish historian on his explanation of what heaven and earth is, he will give you a detailed explanation of the temple and how the temple would have been understood to the Jewish population as heaven and earth. In Isaiah chapter 65, we read another similar story of heaven and earth, the new heavens and new earth. And contrary to popular opinion, there's death in the new heavens and new earth. Yet many of us have been told that the new heavens and new earth would be a place that we would go to upon biological death, and this is where no death will be. Again, we see no more curse here in Revelation chapter 21. We see the new heaven and new earth, yet... I will appeal to Isaiah chapter 65 that is a reversal of the curses in Genesis chapter 1 and the only curse that remains is the curse upon the serpent that he will lick of the dust. 
However, you see in Isaiah 65 that it says, no more will a child who dies, wait, I thought there was no death in the new heavens and new earth. Obviously, there might be biological death. So what is it talking about in Revelation chapter 21, where it says there will be no more crying or, so you know, there will be no more sorrow. Well, what you would have to do is you would have to understand the covenantal curses upon Adam in Genesis chapter 3. You'd have to understand that when it said to Eve that you will bear children doomed to misfortune, or you will bear children in pain, that it was not talking about the biological pain that women feel when they give birth today. It was talking about the pain that children were born under the old covenant. Imagine being born into a covenant of death. That's what they were born into, a failing, faulty system. That was, be, you were bringing children into destruction. Then the serpents, obviously the serpent's punishment is always going to stay there. Adam died, they died, yet now in Christ they're going to be made alive. It was a covenantal promise that they would be made alive. It wasn't a biological promise that you will live forever in some place that we might have made up called the new heavens and new earth. We also get the imagery, as I alluded to earlier in Hebrews, about changing clothes. In 2 Corinthians chapters 3-5, through 5, we see the same thing. The shifting of covenants. That the comparison is the Mosaic covenant of death and the new covenant glories, the more glorious covenant of Jesus Christ, life. The Apostle Paul goes to great lengths throughout his writings to demonstrate what he is preaching to the Gentiles. Again, remember the Apostle Paul to the Gentiles. He's not preaching anything to the Gentiles other than the one hope of Israel. If you read Acts chapter 24, when the Apostle Paul is testifying before one of the kings in that region, he says, I have said nothing other than what the law and the prophets say. And again, we've already noted the exclusiveness of the law and the prophets. The Apostle Paul is saying, I am preaching nothing other than what the law and the prophets say. You follow that, you see the same thing in Acts chapter 26. In Acts chapter 28, the Apostle Paul says, I have preached nothing other than the hope of Israel. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, we read of one hope. We're all united by one hope. And I'm positing that the eschatological hope that was happening in the end was the one hope of Israel, the resurrection of the dead ones. Even rebuking the people at the church at Galatia, the Apostle Paul says, you've gone on to another good news or into another gospel that is no gospel at all. And what that was is the Judaizers were telling them, no, you must be circumcised because when the Lord comes, and remember, these were Christians. A lot of times we get the concept that Judaizers were outside of the church and then they were the Christians who understood the, sacri you know, the sacrifice of Jesus. No, what you had in the first century church was you had Christians who were being confused and being misled by Hymenaeus and Philetus, 2 Timothy chapter 2, to think that we must submit to the law. We must submit to the law. This good news was leading them astray, this false good news. If I may challenge some assumptions this evening, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we read that they believed that the coming of the Lord had already occurred. Many were being misled that the coming of the Lord had already occurred. Well, many, I, while I agree with Pastor Robert that there are many comings of the Lord throughout the Bible, absolutely. They were talking about the eschatological, you know, the end time coming of the Lord, the consummation of all things, the coming of the Lord that would bring rewards, would bring the resurrection of the dead ones, and would ultimately consummate the new heavens and new earth. Yet these people in 2 Thessalonians 2 were being led astray to believe that that had already occurred. Right. Well, my question is, is how if what we have been commonly taught in our culture, that the coming of the Lord is some big cataclysmic event, how could people have been taught in that time that were so much closer to the context of the scriptures, how could they have been taught that this already occurred? Amen. Clearly, there's a, a difference in our understanding versus theirs. If I may also allude to 2 Timothy chapter 2, Hymenaeus and Philetus. And if I may, this is a favorite proof text against the full preterist community where some who are saying that the resurrection has already occurred or leading many astray, stay away from them. And many people will posit that since I do believe that the resurrection of the dead ones has occurred, that I am one of those people you should stay away from. Let me explain. If the Apostle Paul is saying that the res some are saying that the resurrection of the dead ones has already occurred and what that was was talking about a biological resurrection from the grave that many of us have, may have been taught. How could people have believed that it already occurred? You would have seen people roaming around the city and you would have said, uh, okay, yeah, it did occur or you didn't see anybody roaming around the city. You went to the grave. You know, the Apostle Paul could have simply said, hey, go to the tombs and look. Stop being led astray. So clearly, the resurrection of the dead is something other than what we've been taught about biological bodies raising out of the grave, and we're not going to get into how that would work. If I may just make a quick, humorous illustration of my problem with the resurrection of the dead as commonly taught, is that if, let's say a man 
is uh, chopped up into pieces and his body is thrown into the ocean and along comes the tuna fish, along comes all the other sea animals and they eat up these molecules of this body. As we've been taught that at some time in the history, you know, the coming of the Lord, there will be a resurrection. I've always wondered how all the tuna fish, you know, the chopped up thing you have in your cabinet is all going to come together and form this big body. And again, it just sounds kind of ludicrous to me. Especially since in 2 Timothy chapter 2, there were many who were leading many astray. Not some. There weren't some kooks in the church that were saying, oh, well, you know, the resurrection occurred and some people were believing it. Many people were being led astray. Therefore, showing that the resurrection of the dead could not have been this biological raising from the dead that many people are erroneously hoping for. Also, we get to the book of Revelation. Many of us have been taught the scary thrills of Revelation. You know, I remember my mother telling me stories about Revelation when I was younger. I was not brought up Christian. Um, however, she did tell me some of the scary stories just to keep me in line. You know, she didn't do all that much in uh, younger years. Now I'm, I'm learning. So, uh, you see, she would tell me about Revelation and paint this really dark picture of some time in history. However, when we get to Revelation, a couple things just to mention here. There's a temple that they're supposed to measure in Revelation chapter 11. Do you know where that temple is today? It's completely decimated and destroyed. The temple doesn't stand anymore. Can't measure it. So we'd have a problem if that was talking about something for today. If you were to go about reading the book of Lamentations and you were to read that corresponding to the book of Revelation, you would see something very similar. Very similar imagery, very similar story. You know why? The prophet Jeremiah is writing about the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. The prophet John, or the apostle John, is writing about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. End time cataclysmic language, you will find this throughout the prophets. You will read about a coming of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 19 into Egypt. However, we know that it was the Assyrian army that invaded Egypt and judged them, condemned them, because they were used. We you know it was the Assyrian army that came against the people of the Lord, and they were used by God. The prophet Isaiah says that, that Assyria, it will be my tool to judge Israel. But then we know that the Assyrians began to think they were all that great and important and then God would bring judgment upon Assyrians. Those were referred to as comings of the Lord. That was the Lord's judgment being reaped upon people. So that cataclysmic language about the moon turning dark and all these details was happened many times in the Old Testament, yet we don't find this being an uh, event that many people are being taught about today. I would say that the two ages that were represented in the, in the Bible, the Jewish understanding of the two ages, was the Mosaic Age. Again, Matthew chapter 24, the apostles come to Jesus and they ask him, tell us when the end of the age will be. And what's the first thing Jesus does? He goes, see that temple? Which would have been everything to a Jew in the Old Covenant. Yeah, right. See that temple? Not one stone will be left upon another. And that was the sign of the end of the age. And that would bring about where some of our differences in this discussion about, I believe that we are fully in that age to come, fully glorified. Amen. There was a natural covenant that God was working through, and that was Israel. The children of Abraham, according to the natural covenant, remember John the Baptist? Do not think that you have the right to call yourselves the children of Abraham because God could raise up children of Abraham out of those stones. And what was he declaring? He was declaring, this isn't going to be a natural covenant. It's going to be a spiritual covenant. We read in the book of Galatians that you become a child of Abraham by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. So we inherited the blessings. That was the born-again experience. It was being born into Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8 talks about the manifestation of the sons of God. That is what the Jews waited for. They wanted to see that their old covenant people would be raised up. Before Jesus, is there any hope for my people? You know, you read 1 Thessalonians 4. Many people posit it to be a rapture. No, what the Apostle Paul is saying, that don't worry, the dead are going to raise. They will, there will be a part, because the, if you follow the story of the Old Testament, you see so often how important it was to have a lineage. So these Jews are wondering, well, for the longest time, God was operating through our lineage. Now you're saying that Jesus came and there's no hope for my ancestors? No, your ancestors will be raised up. God is faithful to his covenant with Israel. He will raise them up and the Gentiles will glorify him because of all that he did through Israel. I believe that is your eschatological promise. And that is why we live in a fulfilled reality of that new heavens and new earth. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I will not get through this, but I'll try. <coughs> Sorry, being selfish. <laughs> I'll try to get through this. Picking up where I left off, 
the mystery of the kingdom, fulfillment without consummation. That was not merely true during the ministry of Jesus, but it's also true for this present age. Fulfillment of the kingdom coming without a consummation of the kingdom, without a finality. That, in other words, the fullness of the kingdom. My premise on the end times is this. The present reality of new covenant kingdom does not exhaust the scope of prophecy and promises. There yet remains some. I'll too look at Matthew 24. In chapter 23 of the book of Matthew, Jesus tells him in verse 37, to the nation of Israel, I would have gathered you like a mother, like a mother hen carries its chicklets, but you'd have nothing to do with me. He says in verse 38, chapter 3, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Ichabod. The glory has departed. It's done. I believe God loves Jewish people. And there is a hope for Jewish people as there is a hope for Arab people. But no more hope than that. I will say this in chapter four, 24, verse 2. The disciples ask about this destruction, about this, because in chapter 24, verse 1, Jesus says that there will not be one stone laid upon another. And so they ask him, or verse 2, he says, See ye not these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be one stone left upon another, they will all be thrown down. It's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. And the disciples ask him, in verse 3, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And it's apparent and obvious from that that the disciples believed and the understanding of, the, of, of their interpretation and assumption was in one event, this temple that was always held by Jewish people to be indestructible. In one event, in the, in the end of this world, that means if the temple's going to be destroyed, the end of the world. Tell us when it's going to be. And Jesus begins to answer them, and he starts to answer them with the nature of the events surrounding the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple. And he starts to tell them the signs and the times. He starts to talk to them about great tribulation. I believe he, Jesus, the great tribulation Jesus speaks about is A.D. 70. 66 to 70, it is the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, in verse 29, verse 30, he uses strong apocalyptic language to talk about the sun being darkened, the moon not giving light, the stars shall fall from heaven. These verses are not new. They've been used in the Old Testament to talk about the overthrow of kingdoms, to talk about the shaking of, of, of rulers, to talk about new governments. And, and so I believe that those words are not they are talking about a destruction of Jerusalem. I believe verse 30, this is an odd one. This, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. This is, Jesus is likening the destruction of Jerusalem to another coming of his, to a coming of his. But he calls it a sign of the Son of Man in heaven. That is a sign that Jesus reigns. It's not a sign of his coming to earth. It's a sign of him reigning from the heavens. A sign of the Son of Man that I am who I said I am. That I am, in fact, reigning from the heavens and calling the shots, if you will. He prophesied the indestructible destruction of Jerusalem. He prophesied that it would all come down, not one stone would be left upon another. He tells it all. And, uh, and, and so he's, he says, verily, in verse 34, he gives a parable of, of a fig tree in verse 32 and 33. The parable is, as surely as the summer uh, follows the figs, so you shall know when you see these things coming to pass, you shall know that this is, this is when these things are going to happen to Jerusalem. And then he says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass, to all these things be fulfilled. So we're in agreement there. But he goes on in verse 36. And here's what he says. But of that day and hour knows no man or none. And what I find Jesus doing here is he's taking the question of the disciples. Tell us when these things shall be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world or the end of the age. 
this present evil age? And what, Jesus, what he's saying is this. Jesus said, I'll tell you what the signs, what, what the signs of the, what, I'll tell you when these things shall be. You'll see these signs. You'll see the destruction of Jerusalem. You'll see the abomination of desolation. You'll see all those things he predicts. You'll see that and you'll know that. But as far as the finality of everything, that's a separate subject. Amen. That's another time. That's a time no man knows. Another place doesn't Jesus say, I don't even know the hour. He's talking about in his earthly existence. He knows not the hour. Only the Father in heaven has this reserved, has it on reserve. So Jesus is splitting it up here. In verse 36, I find a whole new subject. But of that day and hour, no man knows, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And then he goes on and says, but as it is in the, was in the days of Noah, that's how it's going to be at the coming of the Son of Man. At the, at the final coming. That's not how it was at the destruction of Jerusalem. What was it about the days of Noah? Some people say, oh, he's talking about the wickedness of the generation. No, he's not. He's talking about, they laughed at Noah. They laughed at Noah. Rain. What rain? Judgment. What judgment? As it was in the days of Noah, it speaks of complacency. It speaks of everything's going okay. Jesus likens his coming to a thief in the night. A surprise. Jerusalem A.D. 70 was no surprise. It's, it's filled with signs. It's filled with evidences. It, as, the, as, the, as, the fig tree, as the figs of, uh, tell us it's summer, it's the same way with the destruction of Jerusalem. You're going to see the signs. You're going to know. You're gonna, it's going to be obvious. But as to my coming, nothing obvious about it. Nothing apparent about it. As it was in the two are going to be in the field. One's going to be taken, removed, and the other's going to remain. Two are going to be at the wheel grinding. One's going to be removed. It's a suddenly. It's a surprise. It's an unknown. Watch, therefore. Be alert. For in such an hour as you think not, the Lord comes. And he goes on and on and on. And he starts talking about, read, I challenge you, because of time's sake, to read on your own chapter 25 through this lens and, and, and read chapter 25 with the understanding of, of these things yet to be fulfilled. Um, here's, here's, here's my takeaway on all this. The coming associated with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem can be dated by signs, but the consummation of the age cannot. I make a distinction between the consummation of the covenant and the consummation of the age. The consummation of the covenant has happened. The old covenant's gone. I don't believe it was gone in AD 70. I, de I believe AD 70 was the verification it was gone. I believe it was God's dramatic way of showing, shut down, it's over, no more, because it was already done. It was done at the cross. It was done at Calvary. It was done, in, and, then, and then his resurrection is his ascension to a reign, a present reign, bringing his spiritual dynamic of the kingdom, a reign but not a full realm. The realm is coming in such an hour as you think not. The realm is coming at another time. A distinction between a coming and the coming. I, I, and, and again, I remind you that the Bible never calls this climactic, culminating, culmination of the ages, never calls it the second coming, because there have been other comings. But this is the, the, the one that brings finality. This is the one that brings consummation. So I challenge you to read from uh, chapter 24, the second part, into chapter 25, talk about the virgins who have no oil, they're not prepared, they're not ready. It's all talking... Everybody's going to be ready for AD 70. He told them all about it. Told them everything there was to know. Said it's going to be accompanied by all kinds of signals. All kinds of signs. You got, but this, no, it's all mysterious. It's all, there's nothing, it's all peace and safety. When they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes. And that's the spirit that I see this in. Um, I, 1 Thessalonians 4, by the way, says it this way. I believe it speaks about the, consum the consummatory coming of Christ or the consummation of the ages when in 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says not you shall see the Son of Man in the in, you shall see the Son of Man coming in the heavens but it says the Lord himself shall descend from the heavens. There's a difference. There's a difference between him coming in the heavens or, or, or coming from the, from the seat of his reign so to speak and his actual coming to the earth, where it says the Lord himself shall descend from heaven 
and goes on and says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Even in chapter 5 of 2 Thessalonians, here's what he says. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Well, why don't they have a need to write unto him? He's talking about now this final consumer consummation coming. Well, why does he have no need to write unto them? I mean, do they know everything about it? No. He says, for when you... Sh he says, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. I can't write you about this because I've got nothing to say about this. It comes as a thief in the night. There's no sense me trying to tell you when and how. And no, 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 because th there's no commentary on this. The commentary is be ready. The commentary is... Is, is, is there yet remains something to be fulfilled and something to transpire. For when they shall say peace and safety, then so, AD 70 is not peace and safety. AD 70 is run of the hills. Don't, don't you, my faithful disciples, stay in Jerusalem and try to save it. Get to the hills. Save yourself. Because I'm bringing it down. I'm bringing it down. I'm bringing down the temple. I'm bringing down Jerusalem. I'm bringing down the whole thing. It's obvious. But his coming, his, con his coming in consummation, it's not obvious. Amen. It's hidden. And of course, I got 40 seconds. So of course, <laughs> so, I, I, but I am, so I am a futurist in this regard. Here's how I'm a futurist. I'm a futurist in that I believe in a future final coming of Christ. Three things and only three things remain. I'm not one, I'm not a dispensationalist. I am this. I believe three things remain. A bodily resurrection a final judgment, and an eternal state. And I believe that only in these three will we find the fullness of the redemptive activity of God in reclaiming this earth as his, as his kingdom, as the extension of his glory. Only in that will we fully find it. And I have three pages here, and I'm out of time. I, um, for the resurrection of the dead, I was going to take you through 1 Corinthians 15. Forget that. For the, for, the, for the final judgment of mankind, I was going to take you to John 5, and where, where he talks about the hour is coming and now is, where people are hearing the voice of the Son of God and they're living. And then he says, but I'm telling you there's coming another time when all the tombs are going to be opened. And, and every man will hear his voice and they'll come out, some to the resurrection of life and others to the resurrection of judgment. And I see those as two very different things. Mm -hmm. We are spiritually raised now, but there's a whole other thing coming. Yes. There's a whole other thing yet to happen. And then lastly, is I would have talked about the eternal state, the new heavens and the new earth. Heaven is not a place of our dwelling. It never has been. Heaven is the place of God's dwelling. Earth is the place we dwell, and earth is the place we will dwell. Heaven will be on this earth. It becomes heaven, the earth becomes as a heaven when God finishes all that God is going to do. And until that, we have this age and the age to come blended. It's a reign, but not a realm. It will one day be a reign and a realm. Okay. I think I'll go first. Yes. Um, you know, I guess there's either so many questions I could ask or none. <laughs> so I'll ask one, which is what we said we would do. I just want to get your understanding on that First Thessalonians 4. That, in other words, I, I really see that you're really spiritualizing language. In other words, let me turn to it. In other words, in First Thessalonians 4... Where, where he speaks about, where he speaks about, um, where he speaks about not being concerned uh, about the dead ones, and uh, not being concerned about those that sleep in Christ, and then he talks about don't worry about them, because that's not all, you know in my language that's not all there is to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, these people are coming alive. These people are coming out of, out, of, out, of this, out of this state that they're in. 
the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. So instead of taking this language literally, in other words, in other words you, you spiritualize this language, it seems to me, to say that he's talking about Jewish, God's plan for Jewish people. Race, God, right? Explain it more, that's all. Okay. So uh, here we are, at, uh, First Thessalonians. 413? Oh, yeah, I need the mic, right? Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I thought somebody was yelling at me already. Uh, all right, so 1 Thessalonians 4. I'm going to start at verse 13, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of read through it, and I'm going to explain you know, what, I, what I'm drawing out of this text here. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So clear, obviously, he's talking to them. They know, don't be worried about those that have, you know, died before you, gone before you. For if we believe that Jesus died, so here he's talking to Christians. For if I believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For in this way we say to you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive, again, the Apostle Paul here is including himself in that immediacy of this coming here, or this, this raising up. We which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So he's talking about there's going to be some that are going to be brought to the Lord prior to uh, those that are alive. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, again the Apostle Paul putting himself in the text, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. Now, caught up, this, this causes a problem in our understanding here. The term caught up in this text is harpazo, and harpazo means to be brought together. It, does ne it never denotes a direction. So harpazo, what he's saying here, is that we're going to be brought together in the Lord, and we're going to be raised up, and again, we see this in Ephesians, that we have been raised up and seated in heavenly places. So you see, I would say that I'm not spiritualizing the text, I would say that the text itself is drawing out that, the ga again, remembering the, the problem here is, well, are our ancestors going to be gathered? Are we going to be gathered? Who's going to be gathered first? Is there any hope for them? You know, because again, they were tormented. They were saying, well, our ancestors, I guess, are, you know, they, they, there's no hope for them. They weren't dead in Christ. They didn't die in Christ. They died outside of the glories of the new covenant. So what about them? And he's saying, no, 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 don't worry. The dead in Christ are going to be raised up first. There's going to be hope. And we will be caught together with them we will be, again, I see this as a very clear restoration. You know, again, remembering they had wandered away from the Lord, and the Lord is now pulling them to himself, saying, no, 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 you're all going to be united in me. And I would posit that that is the one body that the book of Ephesians is referring to, where it says that there was no more partition, that there would be Jew and Gentile in one new man. And that was the goal that God was doing from beginning to end, was creating one body. Again, we would all hopefully recognize that we're part of one body. One body that would glorify the Lord. So he was bringing together both the old covenant understanding of the relationship with God, those that had that kept that hope. Again, we see in Hebrews 11 that those old covenant forefathers would have that resurrection in Christ, that they were a part of that covenant apart from Jesus, that their faith was what would bring them to be a part of that covenant with Jesus. So here, I, I believe very clearly the Apostle Paul is alluding that we shall all be caught up, caught together with the Lord. Okay. Oh, I ask a question. All right. My question is going back to Matthew chapter 24. Mm. See, so I got to tone myself down. I, I can be <laughs> somewhat rough when I, when I ask questions, so I'm working on it. Um, what I would say is here in Matthew chapter 24, we see a correspondence of Matthew chapter 24 to Mark chapter 13 to Luke chapter 21. Mm -hmm. Now, when we read through these texts, you'll notice if, uh, let's see, for example, here in Matthew chapter 24, but of that day, as you referred to, that the hour knoweth no man, no angel of the heaven, but of my Father only, but as the days of Noah, so you imposed a sort of a, a distinction here that they, he was talking about the AD 70 coming before and now he's referring to the physical coming. Right. Now, obviously the one thing I, I would ask you, and I'm just going to ask you to explain, mm -hmm. is here in Matthew, he's saying immediately after the tribulation, right there in verse 29, he says immediately after the tribulation of those days, mm -hmm. and I guess I would ask you to draw out more how you you divide this and how Mark 13, 34 corresponds to that and yet uses it in a different point. It uses it in the verses that would be clearly applying to the destruction of Jerusalem. 
Chef. Okay. 1334. No. Sorry. Okay. Um, it's got to be 24. 24. 24. Sorry about that. Is that known? Yeah. 24. Okay, yes, but in those days after the tribulation, the sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light, the stars of heaven shall fall, then the Son of Man shall be coming in the clouds with great power and glory, send his angels. Mm -hmm. And again, he's, it's a similar story, but we're not seeing the division. All right, let me, let me just, uh, I, you know, I was trying to rush through that because I was hoping to get to my, my wonderful exposition <laughs> of First Corinthians 15 and all those other cool verses and show you that it's a bodily resurrection and everything. But uh, I kind of slipped that in. So, <laughs> no. So anyhow, uh, no. To understand me, I was saying that that verse in Matthew 24, speaking about, speaking about the sun being darkened and the moon not giving a light, I wasn't transposing that off to some future thing. I was tying that directly in. Directly in to the destruction of Jerusalem, that those are highly symbolic terms, apocalyptic language, that was common throughout the Old Testament to describe the overthrow of cities, governments, principalities, things, things of that nature. So I think that those verses are not a reference. I believe the verse 30, the, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. That is directly related to that the destruction of Jerusalem was a sign of the Son of Man, a sign of a vindication of his person. It was a proclamation of who he was. It was, it was him reigning from heaven, bringing about the destruction of Jerusalem as he spoke it and as he prophesied it. So this is all pertaining to that. It's only in verse 36 does he take up that other subject. See, the disciples ask it with the assumption that it's all happening at one time. That, that, that kind of parallels and ties in with the prophetic language of the Old Testament where they always thought it was going to all happen at one time in that telescopic lens where they saw all the, the, the Messiah would come and everything would happen. Well, the disciples, when, when they heard about this destruction of Jerusalem, they took it all as one thing. The end of the age would be at the same time. And Jesus protracts it. Jesus says, there's going to be, I'll tell you when this temple is going to be destroyed. But as far as the end of the age, I can't tell you that. I can only tell you that, and that's where he picks up in verse 36, but of that day and hour knows no man. And he begins that whole new subject, so to speak, part B. He answers question part A in that first part. He answers part B in that second part. This is not, you know, my, just my own little insight. This is, you know, the same way you have others that say some of the things you say, and I also have others that say... In fact, it's funny because I prepared this whole thing and I pulled out uh, Richard Lenski. He's a Lutheran, uh, one of my favorite New Testament commentaries. And I just, not that I had a lot of spare time, but in my spare time, I pulled out Lenski's commentary on Matthew 24. And this is exactly what it says. And, and uh, so Lenski is now my favorite commentary. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, since there's a number of questions, this might... Get a little tricky with the microphone here, a lot of moving and shaking, but we'll just start with this. Uh, simply put, do you believe the fullness of salvation was at the cross because Hebrews mentions he will come again with salvation? Oh, I like that question. Okay. It's not directed at anyone, so you can answer. Oh. Okay. Well, you see, salvation is a very generic term. And salvation encompasses the fullness of redemption. So that's why Paul can fuse language and say, we were saved, we are saved, and we will be saved. Because, because salvation, uh, the totality of our, our redemption is not yet applied. We have, in other words, the, the consummation of all that it implies. Let's say it this way. The consummation of all that it implies is not yet appropriated. We haven't had it all. That's why... Now, in my estimation, that's why we're still sick. And that's why we still die. And that's why we still don't have the fullness. See, if I got into some of the other stuff I, uh, I have here, I think part of my understanding would be that even the creation has suffered from the curse of the fall. And all the effects of the curse of the fall are going to be overcome by the glory of God. And so there's going to be 
So the answer is no. Yes, I believe it's all paid for at Calvary. Yes, I believe it's all accomplished at Calvary. But it's not all applied at Calvary. It's not all unfolded at Calvary. It is finished that it might be done. So now it's being done. You want me to answer it too? If you want to. Yeah, I'll answer it. In Hebrews chapter 9, we read, uh, actually, I'll turn to the text. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. It says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them who look for him, he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now, as I mentioned, the covenant story. I've been telling you a covenant story tonight. And if you remember, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, the name of Jesus is that he shall save his people from their sins. So I would posit that the people that were under that covenant of sin, that again, noting the law was the covenant of sin and um you know, Galatians shows that if the law was added to increase transgression, to lead to the Messiah. So his people were under this burden of sin and death. His people would have understood the act of atonement, which is being outlined here in Hebrews chapter 9, from Leviticus chapter 16. And Leviticus chapter 16 mentions how a high, the high priest would enter into the most, well, he would enter into the holy place. Um, he would enter in and he would offer the sacrifice and then he would come out to tell the people that he has now been you know declared worthy to enter into the the holy of holies on behalf of his people and now so he would come out the first time i'm good to go in for you and if you use this with jesus you know that jesus died he was buried he raises up comes out the first time i am good enough to go into the holy place the holy of holies as the book of hebrews says that he ascended into the true holy of holies which the tabernacle was just an example so he ascends into the true holy of holies to appear before the father to atone his people now remember the covenant story i've been telling you atone his people from their sins and he must appear a second time and israel would wait outside that temple day and night waiting for their messiah to appear to say you are now not guilty. because we have God has forgiven your sins and removed your sins from among you. So I would say Hebrews 9.28 is demanding a coming of the Lord for the salvation of his people. Obviously, the cross being that beginning of that atonement process, the high priest would slaughter the sacrifice. He would say, it is finished, as Jesus said on the cross, would then go into the holy place and then would come out to declare salvation for his people. So the preterist presupposition would be that Hebrews 9.28 must be fulfilled. The coming of the Lord must have already occurred or the people are still waiting or, you know, we might, obviously we could defeat, default to progressive sanctification, um, something I don't agree with. Therefore, that is the, the argument for Hebrews 9.28 from a preterist position. Good? All right. Okay. You have to Apologize for the questions. There's a lot directed just at Pastor Robert, so I'm not trying to leave you out. I'm trying trying to mix them in, but you know, it, it's kind of top, kind of top heavy. So, so this is directed at you, Pastor Robert. But you know, Pastor Mike, you can chime in too. If this age is ruled by sin, of what value was Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection? And they're referencing Romans six. Verse 6 and 7. Yes, make, let me make it very clear, and I think this touches on the question. I didn't say we were dominated by sin. Because the powers, the transfer that's taken place between us being in Adam and being in Christ has canceled the dominion of sin in our lives. Amen. It doesn't mean not that we do not sin. The principle of sin still resides. The dominance of sin is destroyed. Amen. Um, positionally, we're completely righteous in Christ. Amen. And experientially and conditionally, as we, as we participate in the life of Christ, we overcome and, and, and have dominion through the new, through the spirit of life. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law, which is not the law of the Old Testament. It's the principle. The law, the principle. The principle of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the principle of sin and death that works in our members. 
So there's a transference of kingdoms. We have been taken out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Amen. That's transpired already. That's not going to happen at this consummation. That's already happened. I believe that we in a spiritual resurrection. I believe that every believer is spiritually raised. I just don't believe that's all there is to it. Amen. I just don't believe that's the extent of it and the limits of it. I don't think that we've seen yet the limits of it. Amen. And yet I believe in the spirit. Now don't forget, besides, I am a Pentecostal preacher. And I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. All right, so I believe in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yes. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Yes. I <laughs> That's actually funny. Wait, wait. <laughs> uh, 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 I also believe there'll come a day we won't need them anymore. But I don't think that that day's now. I don't think that stays now. I don't know that I fully answered the question, but that's what I got out of the question. I, I think, yes, there, you know, if, there's, if, if we're still in this present evil age, we are not of this present evil age. There has been a separation. There has been a translation. There has been, you know, we're in this world, but not of it. So we're of another. I love when Paul says his citizenship's in heaven. So, you know, that kind of concept. If that, did I? Yes, Mike, anything? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll kind of, since there's no questions for me, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Um, one thing that, I'll just make it quick. One, one of the things that preterism does is, well, for me, um, you know, I, I grew up uh, not really paying attention to grammar. I'm not a grammatical type of guy. You know, if you read my writings, you'll understand this comma's missing. You know, I spelled things wrong. Actually, if you got the bulletin, you'll understand I made it. I'm responsible <laughs> for that. So... Uh, the reason I say that is because one of the things that was taught to me in my Bible reading when I, you know, started to really get, be a little bit more diligent in my understanding was that I had to read pronouns. And, for example, just going right here to Romans chapter 6, verse 6, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Rome. He's not writing to an individual. He's writing to the church at Rome. And he says this, knowing this, that our, right there causes me to pause. Somebody, they're sharing in something here. Our body, our old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed. I've already told you what I believe the body of sin is and where I believe that contextually is focused on Israel. Therefore, that body of sin, that old covenant that they're dealing with, that old man is crucified with Christ, as Hebrews 13 says, that that is what was passing away, that old covenant, the new is coming in, that was being crucified with Christ. The body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So I would say that clearly, again, noting a Jewish understanding of the book of Romans, I believe is important to impose, is that a lot of times we, we interpret this as being written to a Gentile audience. I believe understanding that it's written to a Jewish audience, and they would have understood more clearly, for example, in Philippians chapter 3, you see our body, which is you know a topic for another time. But our body shall be made like his glorious body. The question that the preterist asks is, well, then what was the body that they were all sharing. And that is why when we read, for example, Romans chapter 6, we would say that there is a our component. There's a, a corporate component of a group of people that's being dealt with in this text. And we'll go to this question. But I would say our refers to every Christian whether they be a Jewish believer or Gentile believer or any kind of believer. So our just refers to those people, those that are of faith. But this is not true of unbelievers. Amen. Okay, this correction, this, this question is not directed at anyone in particular. So, Adam lived to be many years. What were his accomplishments? I guess it's more. How the heck would I know? What, <laughs> <laughs> what, what does that mean? Maybe more what was his purpose? Or no. I could answer it. I think it's more like. <laughs> I can answer it. Good. I didn't understand. <laughs> no, no offense to everyone. No, no. Well, I would say that Adam lived. Obviously, he Adam died that day, right? But he lived to be 930 years old, as oh, drawn out throughout the text. So. What were his accomplishments? I would say Adam lived uh, past that death, whatever that death was. And I would say that he served as a covenantal forefather to Israel. And uh, that might be all I would be able to draw out of the text. I, I believe that's pretty much what Adam, he was a covenantal head. He was the, the forefather of Israel. He went about to, if I may say that 
Adam failed in eating the, the fruit, right? And his descendants clearly bore the, uh, you know, the repercussion of that sin. However, the glory is that Seth, his Sethites began to call upon the name of the Lord. So you see grace happening right there in the story. Because I happen to believe that the reason you call upon the Lord is because the Lord has put it within you to call upon the Lord. Therefore, you see the grace of God being relayed right through the lineage of Adam right there mm. in the beginning of mm. creation. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. But uh, also, also, I mean, don't you think that part of Adam's purpose was to continue to procreate? So, Amen. So, be so, fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. And also, though the image of God in, in man is defaced, it's not destroyed. And so, and, and redemption is God's plan. So part of, part of God's plan for Adam was not for him to be eternally lost, but God's plan for Adam is for him to be eternally redeemed. And so, so there's another reason for his continuing beyond the fall, because for purposes of, of receiving grace. Amen. Okay. Yeah, let's say you hold me. Why not do this? Need this might be it. easier now. Yeah. Pastor Robert, the age to come when it comes, will it be a physical, eternal presence here on earth? And will the dead in Christ partake in that age? Okay. I, 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 my understanding is this. The more, and, and, and I thank Pastor Michael, because to be honest with you, if I, if I didn't take this, cha this challenge has helped me do a lot of refining in my thinking. If I tell you that coming into tonight, for my own good, not that I needed to do it for what we were presenting tonight. I can't hold this. Why not? Because it's breaking the connection. No. For, my own, for my own good, um, and not so much for um, just having to prepare for tonight, I went way beyond what's necessary for preparation. And to be honest with you, I probably read thousands of pages. And, and, and it, w it was good for my own study. I said all that to say this. My understanding is that I dare anyone to find a place in Scripture that, finds, that says heaven's going to be where we're going. Because I can't find one. The earth is where we're going. And I do believe, though, in a redemption of the earth. The earth becomes heaven. The dwelling place of the redeemed. The new heavens and the new earth the new heavens are a refined heavens where, where all principalities are utterly demolished. The new earth is a renovated earth. I don't believe in the destruction. I was going to get into this in one of my things with 2 Peter 3. I don't believe that the, the earth will be destroyed by fire. I think the earth will be refined. It'll be un righteousness will be uncovered. The only thing that will remain is righteousness. Whatever is not of righteousness will be destroyed, and whatever is of righteousness will remain. So he said we seek a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Complete righteousness. Utter righteousness. Only eternal things. What that's going to be like, I don't know, but I could tell you this. Don't buy the book of the guy who went to heaven and is going to tell you what it's like because he's wrong. I don't know what happened to him, but I know that that's not what the Word of God teaches. And where the Word of God is silent, I think we've got to be silent. But I think the Word of God does teach that there's going to be a refining of things. In, in 2 Peter 3, Peter talks about two things. He talks about the flood of Noah, and he talks about the fire of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then he talks about the refining of the earth. The flood of Noah was not to destroy the earth. It was to destroy wickedness. Righteousness remained. That's Noah and his family. The judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah was not to destroy the earth. It was to destroy wickedness. And if you understand, and I did a lot of reading on the language of 2 Peter 3, the word talks about an uncovering and not a destruction of the earth. It talks about a revealing of righteousness. And so I believe in this consummation of the ages, the things that are eternal are going to remain. I think, I think when the Bible talks about the judgment seat, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And it talks about wood, hay, and stubble all being burned. And gold and precious stones and those things remaining. It all ties in with that picture of a coming where everything 
that's been tainted by sin and ruined by sin is going to be, all those factors are going to be removed. And so there'll be an eternal state. Uh, this is the question. I mean, the question of questions. What kind of bodies will we have? The question of questions. What kind of earth will it be? Because the pew you sit in is rotting and, 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 and needs, needs tending to. But if there's things that aren't going to decay, and things that aren't going to compromise, not, no longer tainted by the effects of sin in the fall. So do I believe in, in those things? I do. Do I understand them all? I don't. But, but I do believe that, that they're indicated in Scripture. I said it was a good idea to take it off, but I don't know if I agree anymore. What is Thessalonians talking about, referencing the meaning of those who have fallen asleep in Jesus will rise first? And it's not directed at any one person. I think I already explained Yeah, Pastor Michael had his chance to really explain that. Of course, I would take it the more traditional way. And, and of course, the traditional way of taking 1 Thessalonians 4 is the concern about what is going to happen to those of us, to our loved ones, who have died, and, and, and there's going to be a coming of the Lord, and they're not going to get to experience that, because they're dead. They're in the grave, not spiritually, literally. They're not here to experience the coming of the Lord. And Paul says, don't worry about them. The dead in Christ. Those who have physically died in Christ, knowing Christ, being positionally in Christ, they will be raised first. And we which are alive and remain, Paul wasn't referring to himself, he was referring to Christians. Whatever Christians, including me, if I'm around at the time, Whatever Christians are alive and remain, we believers that are alive and remain, shall be caught up to meet him in the air. Doesn't mean we're going to get caught up and make some about face and disappear for X amount of years. No indication of any of that. No U-turns. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. And there'll be a gathering, as, as, as Pastor Michael said, a gathering of all from the dead. I agree with him. Don't ask me to explain how the one that was eaten by the tuna fish. Uh, don't ask me to explain uh, how these elements are going to come together. Or if they're going to come together in our own. You know, let's remember something about the Bible. When God says, says things to us, anything God says to us, he's condescending. You know, when I say condescending, I don't mean he's like belittling us. I mean he's coming, he's accommodating. He's coming down to our level. You must be born again. What does that mean? Well, he puts it in a way we can kind of understand it. But the words born again do not exhaust the limits of what it means to be regenerate. They help describe it. They help to give an aspect of it. They help describe the indescribable. So just keep that in mind when you read your Bible, that our minds can't possibly comprehend a, uh, the fullness of some of these things. So I don't know how it will all happen. I just, I just, I just understand that, that from this scripture, I can't see it any other way, but that to say that there'll be a, 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 a literal raising of the dead, a gathering, and we'll all be changed. That's the transformation of these corruptible, must put on incorruption. First Corinthians, my take on 1 Corinthians 15 is not about some kind of covenantal thing. My take on 1 Corinthians 15 is they were falling into a Gnostic belief of, of, of you know, of uh, this, this, this church in Corinth was starting to say the resurrection, there's no resurrection. Some of them thought they were so spiritually superior they were already raised and, and all of this stuff. And Paul's correcting it and saying, hold it. It's not all done yet. You don't have it all yet. It's not all finished yet. And that's the, way, the, the lens from which I read 1 Corinthians 15. And, and, he, and he, whatever way Jesus was raised as the first fruits, 
is the way we're going to be raised as the last fruits. <laughs> and, and, and I don't see any distinction. What kind of body Jesus has, that's a tough one. But whatever body that is, is, this, is the body that we're going to have. And I, I, I think I, I, can't, I can't get away from that, the significance of that in 1 Corinthians 15. When it says it's raised and sown in a natural body, it's talking about being sown into the earth, how it all goes down. It's in its weakness, in its frail and corrupted state. Not sin state, but the sin consequence state. How, it, how, how that, the raising is not, it's by, by, by natural and spiritual, it's not, it's not even contrasting physical and spiritual. It's contrasting earthly and heavenly. It's contrasting the means by which it's raised. It's raised by the spirit. And it's raised to a spiritual, a spiritual realm, as opposed to the, the first, this body is acclimated to a natural dimension, and that body is acclimated to a more supernatural and spiritual dimension. And that's what I see in the breakdown of the language of 1 Corinthians 15. That's good. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have time for the remainder of the questions, but we got through a number of them. Is there one for Pastor Michael, but specifically? No, we got to those. There were a few double. There were a few questions that were in there. To be fair, there were a few questions that were in there twice. We tried to get through as much as we can, but you know, sorry if your question wasn't wasn't gotten to. It's nothing personal, just time issues. Anyway, um, the last section, just a couple closing remarks. We're going to give them five minutes more each, just to close things out, share whatever they want to do, and to be fair, we kind of bounced around on who went first, who went second, I think this time I'll do a coin toss, and Pastor Mike, you, you can, that's why I needed the coin, Pastor Mike, you can just uh, call it in the air. This is the exciting... Heads. Heads. Heads, so you can choose, first or second? First. First, all right. Here you go. Well, first off, I want to say thank you to you all for being here this night, this evening. I, I think it's an amazing thing that uh, here at our, at our church, we're doing a conference called The Power of Preterism. And what you've seen tonight, when two men can get up in front of a group of people that have differing views and can expound on these things in love in a Christian spirit, to me, that is one of the major reflections of the power of preterism. So... The reason I say that is because obviously I believe my position is true. Therefore, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna say that this is one of the reasons. This is one of the many things. Um, I believe it's edifying that two men can get together and we can edify each other to challenge, you know, to read our Bibles. We've been, you know, meeting four or five week, um, weeks now continually, uh, harping on the scriptures, talking about where we have some difference. And I've enjoyed every single meeting that I've had with Pastor Robert. I've enjoyed meeting his son. I've been meeting, enjoyed meeting other people through him. So I say all that because preterism obviously knows that in a traditional way it's new on the scene. And we know that we have a lot of questions to answer, a lot of details that need to be examined. What the oper where I operate from, my understanding operates from what I would say we need to understand how the original audience would have understood the details that we're saying in our scripture. I would obviously charge the, the popular traditional view of resurrection of the dead, judgment, um, new heavens and new earth, with coming to a, a more modern understanding than what the original audience would have perceived these details to be. I alluded to 2 Timothy chapter 2 on the resurrection of the dead that they had believed that already occurred. I alluded to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that they believed that the, dead, that the day of the Lord had already occurred. And they were confused by these things. If I may offer some other insights on the power of preterism would be that the optimistic worldview it provides we do not live in a um, view that we're under law. We do not live in a view that we are coming under judgment. Instead, we know that we have been already judged in Christ, that we find ourselves in righteousness, thus fulfilling that promise of 2 Peter chapter 3, that in the new covenant is wherein dwells righteousness. We find that what we're seeing in Scripture is the change from an old covenant of death, a body of death, into the body of life, the body of Christ, the raising up of that body. And we believe that the Scriptures tell that story from Genesis to Revelation. If I may just throw some ideas out there tonight for consideration in regards to the different views that were presented here tonight. In 2 Peter 3, it talks about the burning up of the elements. And we see this also in the book of Galatians, these elements, the stoichia, 
And I would posit that these elements were the elements of the Mosaic Law that needed to be taken away, needed to be burned up as being related. Stoichia being used in Galatians, Stoichia being used in 2 Peter chapter 3. Also, one of the major contentions of the preterist position is that if we are to impose a biological understanding on the death of Adam, that if we biologically die in Adam and Christ died to remove sin from us, died in our place, that when I biologically die, I'm paying the penalty for my sins. So the, the question the preterist asks is, well, is this the original concept of, or is this the concept of scripture? Is this what they were really concerned with? Or was it Adam died a covenantal death and Jesus completely, fi finally restored us to Jesus and therefore I do not pay any of the penalty for my sins. We believe it was a completely covenantal death that happened to Adam. Adam was removed from, the, from that relationship with God, that nakedness, that, blameness, that blamelessness that he had before God. And that in Christ we can find that same, we can find a restoration to what Adam lost in the Garden of Eden. And that is the story I believe is being told from the beginning to the end of your Bible. Is the story of your redemption, the story of your being brought in to share in the glories and the riches of Jesus Christ. So the preterist doesn't stand as a heretic. Hopefully you've all seen. We, have, we can keep going. And what I would say is this. I'm going to end on this. I appreciate the, the insights that we've brought forth tonight. I appreciate the, the gentleness of all of you to listen here tonight. And I say don't let it end. Let's continue to challenge tradition because we, we would be very surprised, and I imagine everybody in this room would be very surprised to learn a lot of the stuff you might believe in the back of your mind has been mediated to you through tradition. And you were taught that somewhere down the line rather than coming to that conclusion of yourself. And I believe that we have the same challenge before us that the Pharisees did in the first century. Do not allow the traditions of men, the thoughts and the concepts of men, to make the word of God of no effect. Recognize the reconciliation in Christ and fully live in the reality that Christ has brought. Thank you. I, too, appreciate Pastor Michael greatly, and even him uh, welcoming me the way he has. This is uh, to, to open the doors of this church to somebody outside knowing that I'm coming with a different position. It takes an element of courage. It takes an element of, uh, of, of boldness. It takes an element of, uh, uh, of confidence in, in, in what he does believe. And, and, and so there's, there's a lot to be credited there. And I also got to know him a little bit as a person, and he's a good man. And, uh, and I appreciate that. I, I want to say that our conflict is not whether the Bible tells the truth. Our conflict is how it tells it. Or more particularly, what truth it tells. And I think that um, I actually agree that everything Pastor Michael says that we have spiritually, we have now. I just think that there's another conditional I don't mean conditional like that we must meet conditions. I mean, there's a, another element that's going to happen to our present condition. And that's why I bring in the bodily stuff and the changing of, of things. I think redemption is fully accomplished. It's fully paid for. It's, 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 it's fully part of the plan of God, and it will unfold over a time frame. So, so I, I think we agree a lot on the spiritual aspects. Anyhow, my position, though, is that the Bible... Uh, is ultimately a book for all people, though it's given to a people uh, to be that witness and to, and to share it. And our difference is I think it's important sometimes to do to, to some things we, we could be very strong and adamant about. I understand somebody did something yesterday on the deity of Christ. These are fundamental foundational things that we must adhere to and adhere to. Uh, there are other things in the Bible that we have to, we have to say we're inclined to believe. And I think that's very important. That'll help us not to battle by being inclined and always being open to certain revision, even in our belief. I think I've come a long way in not being a dispensationalist. <laughs> you know, the Assemblies of God, the Assemblies of God Pentecostal denomination writes dispensationalism into their tenets of faith. That means if you want to be an Assemblies of God minister, you must be a dispensationalist. I mean, technically. I don't think they all are.
<laughs> Anyhow, it's very important that we, uh, that to understand sometimes confusion helps us come to conclusions. And so confusion has a value. If there, I, I had a, a girl walk out of our Bible, one of our Bible college classes when the, when the, when the professor uh, spoiled her idea of mansions in heaven. <laughs> and she cried and she wept and she left the room. Because all her life she had this idea of this mansion. And, and, and he, he helped her understand that Jesus was pre preparing a place and a, and a, a place for her in the, in the scheme of God and, and other things that really upset her. But anyhow, there are a few dangers. I only have a short time. A few dangers and cautions I would give out. One is let's not let our presuppositions, our schemes, be so intact like the dispensationalists so that now everything in Scripture, we're trying to fit the framework. We're trying to make everything fit so that we could be consistent and, 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 and bolster our beliefs. Let's be cautious of that. If my, if my beliefs, if there's some loopholes, I, 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 I've got to accept that. I can't just make my scheme so solid. And I think that's an important thing. Uh, let's not assign the same definition uh, and application to words in the Bible unilaterally. We must be very careful when we talk about death. But the Bible talks about death in many ways. There is a covenantal death, but there's a literal death. There's all kinds of uses of the word death. There's the death of the old man and, and, and these things. And I, uh, Then resurrection, same thing. I, I am raised. I am seated together in heavenly places with Christ. Pastor Michael is, but I am too. Amen. Praise God. Yeah. Right? I am. But that's not the only resurrection. The end. Even the term end. When we read about the end. <laughs> the end of what? The end of Jerusalem. The end of the age. Which I would say is the end of all things. And, and so on and so forth. Flesh. There's different aspects and dimensions depending on, so we always have to look at concept, context, we have to look at the general genre of literature, the type of literature, we have to be very cautious not to reinter reinterpret terms. These are just some things, um, context is so important, location, location, location. And, and you know, they say that in real estate, but that's the real estate of the Bible too. Location, 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 very important, right? Uh, let's not ignore or discount the history of the church. I realize that we must not live by the history of the church. We must not let that rule everything we believe. But let's not chuck these men aside. Let's be very cautious in, 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 in mocking the creeds of the church and not using these things as boundaries and guardrails because that's what they are. They were set up for God, boundaries and guardrails to keep us on a certain track and they are valuable in their own right though the scripture is the ultimate rule. And lastly, beware that in our study uh, that we don't just study one camp. Very important. I always made up my mind that if I was going to read one book with this view, I was going to read another book with another view. And I've always been that way. Believe me, if, if I only read, if I'm a Pentecostal preacher, and if I only read Pentecostal literature, two things would be true. I wouldn't be sitting here tonight. I don't think Pastor Michael would have me. And that's one. <laughs> and number two, number two is I wouldn't have the 7,000 books I have in my library, that most of which have probably come from a reform camp written in the 1800s by the great scholars of, you know, the guys who ended up, you know, in Princeton and, and the Yale lectures and all those things, great, great stuff. I live by that stuff. That's, that's, those guys knew their stuff. Um, so lastly, just I'm on it. I'm hopeful that Pastor and Mike, Michael and I will continue our conversation and maybe do some other things down the road as long as we keep it on this kind of way. Mm -hmm. I, li I honestly like, I like questions. I, li I would even like a conversation where we just have an open conversation or I would like and welcome the idea of even a presentation without any questions where we just present our side on things and let people think. Think for crying out loud. <laughs> God gave you, God gave you a brain. My, my grandmother used to say. <laughs> That's good. That's good. How how many received some things to think about tonight? Yes. All right. Well, why don't you just give a round of applause for Pastor Mike and Pastor Robert? Everything they did tonight. Why don't you just take a moment, give a nice, bigger round of applause for your moderator tonight. I think you did a just wonderful job. And, and if you're comfortable with it, an even bigger one for God. I mean, hey. hey.
I mean, no. If it wasn't, if it wasn't for what Christ did, however we place it, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be in this place tonight. So we just give him thanks. And if I take 12 seconds and just encourage on some of the things that they shared, it's just bellowing from inside of me that we shouldn't be so quick to change our minds on everything. We shouldn't be so quick to just have itching ears and hear everything and go off into what was called false teachings and things like that that Paul even said, hey, you know, I came and I taught you all this and now you're running away with some other crazy thing. We shouldn't be quick to do that. But we must always watch the fine line between conviction and stubbornness. Because these stubbornness will make us fight with one another. Stubbornness will make us dig our feet so deep that our position can never change and we have no idea where we're standing in or why we're standing there, but because it was taught, because it was compelling. Because, you know, people will come with compelling stories and tales and proof that are wrong. The disciples, uh, I mean, Paul went and preached. Remember, he's writing to these people that he was there firsthand. Paul, with that road to Damascus experience that set it on a generational change, and yet they went in another direction. So let's not be so naive or ignorant that it can't happen to us. So let's be guarded, but let's go by our convictions and not be stubborn, because stubbornness will never lead us anywhere. Some things that I thought before maybe aren't so in light of some new ideas and other things and we must always be willing and ready to grow. I know when I was first saved, what I know or think I know today is in many ways so different than then. And that's a good thing. And that's okay. As long as our hearts are in the right place. And to close on that, it's getting back to what Paul said. He said, you know, covet spiritual gifts and desire these things, but let me show you a better way. If I don't have love, I have nothing. However we stand when we leave tonight, as Christians, as believers, if we don't have God's love working through us, where's the work of Christ in our life? If we don't walk in His love for one another, what does the rest of the world see? So let's walk in His love. Let's let these things in the Scriptures transform and change us the way Christ has by coming in our hearts. Didn't mean to get heavy on you, but I just wanted to encourage you. <laughs> anyway, thumbs up. All right, thumbs up. <laughs> His graphs are quite helpful, aren't they? You won't forget it. Anyway, before we leave, just want to let you know two things. There's a little basket in the back for donations if, if you feel led to give something. And there's some resources on the table. Pastor Robert's book I had mentioned before. Are your, is your book back there as well? No, it's not. Pastor Mike doesn't care about his book that much. But, you know, <laughs> Pastor Roberts is pretty good. Here it is, Hidden Treasure, Unlocking God's Word. Just a series of expositions, applications, kind of like a devotional. real in-depth devotional that pulls out the scriptures. Anyway, it's normally $12, but tonight we just want to make it 5 so anyone who wants it can get a hand on it. Um, it's back there. There's a brother who said he'll help out with that. He might just pocket it. That's fine. God bless you. <laughs> Whatever you want. So books and resources and, and let's, let's let it be fruitful in our lives. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. May I just ask if we end in a moment of prayer? Yeah. Alright. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we open up this night in real praise, Lord God. And we thank you for gathering us here. I pray that everybody leaves here safe and encouraged together on Sunday morning, Lord, to worship you. Lord, we thank you for this evening. I thank you for Pastor Robert. I thank you for Jared. And I thank you for everybody here. We offer this night up again in glory to you, Lord, in worship of you. I pray that each and every person here feels compelled, Lord, and edified to worship you in spirit and in truth. Let your name be glorified. Amen. In Jesus', Jesus name. Amen. 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 Am